Hello, 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 and uh, welcome to our tutorial set uh, for a DA10 uh, course. And I guess I should kind of explain really uh, shortly what, what the course is about, just so that we have it recorded here. Um, so the course is aimed at uh, second year uh, students, architecture students in Lund. And we will be focusing on Rhino as, as the primary program, I guess the only program in this course. And I'll cover the basics of Rhino, as well as I'll do a small project, like explaining my thinking process and so on from start to finish, just to show you the, you know, the, the workflow, uh, how you can, you know, just kind of start with a blank uh, file and end up with some sort of a architectural project. So, uh, for those of you who are students in Lund, uh, you will already see, you know, the course description in the in the website. But it's basically aimed at uh, complete novices, uh, people who don't have a like uh, earlier knowledge of the the software of Rhino. So I will start the first part of of, of this uh, this tutorial series by just explaining the user interface uh, of Rhino and, uh, you know, sh showing what it can do. And then uh, at later stages, we will move into actually uh, making stuff, right? So once you load up Rhino um, and you just create a new quick document, <clears throat> you will see this kind of a view. It might be a little bit different, you know, things might be stretched out and so on. So first things first, you can uh, resize things, right? By just uh, finding the edge of any, um, yeah, finding an, an edge of uh, every, uh, how are these called? Panels, I guess, uh, and toolbox, uh, and just resizing it. So that's uh, that's convenient if you want to customize your stuff. Um, so those of you who already used AutoCAD and uh, as, as learned students, you already have used AutoCAD. So you'll notice that there is a command line here. So Rhino and AutoCAD uses uh, uh, quite similar uh, words for commands, uh, move, scale, rotate, offset, uh, and so on. So your knowledge that you uh, gathered during the AutoCAD course will transfer into Rhino quite easily. So that's nice. Um, but first things first. So here in the top, you see file, edit, view, curve, blah, 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 blah right? Uh, these menus here. These menus are basically where all of the tools are, but they are kind of hard to access because, you know, if you want to go to offset, I don't even know where offset is. Uh, it's, it's probably under curve, offset, offset curve, right? So you would need to do a lot of movement here in these menus to find offset. It's much better to use command line. Uh, also, you have like the file tab where you can save, uh, open, import stuff and so on. We will be using uh, tools from, from uh, the file tab quite often, uh, just if we need to import, export or something like that. But uh, right now I will not be covering most of these. Uh, we will just use them as we need to. Um, but these are pretty self-explanatory, I think. Then on the left hand side, I'll immediately jump to the left-hand side and then we'll look at these tabs here. On the left-hand side, you have the menu, or you might see it like that, right? But if you just expand it a little bit, then you'll have two rows. I prefer to have it in two rows or two columns. So you have a, a, a menu of all of the tools that are mostly used within a, a particular workflow, right? So how do you change workflows or work modes? Well. This is where these tabs here in the top come in, right? Standard, C planes, set view, display, blah, 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 all of these tabs. And as I change some of them, for instance, curve tools, uh, if I change it to curve tools, you can see that the left hand side menu changes. So while curve tools tab here in the top has um, like stuff that you could only see or tools that you can only see in the curve tools menu, uh, here uh, you can find all of the different, like more general tools that might be used within the curve editing mode. So for instance, if you're drawing curves, you might want to switch to curve tools tab. If you're drawing surfaces or modeling surfaces, you switch to surface tools tab. 
And then you have solid meshes and so on. Um, and some other stuff that we will uh, look at later. 99% of the time, I just stick to the standard tab and I just use the standard tab and the tools that are here because 99% uh, of the time, I just need the standard tools, right? I don't need to go too deep into um, like more, uh, more customized uh, things. So we'll stick to the standard tab. Then on the right hand side here, you see, uh, let me move my screen real quick. There we go. Um, on the right hand side, you see a properties tab. So right now we don't have any objects uh, in our scene, in, in our model. So the properties tab are actually of the camera. So it's the camera settings that is looking at the current view, right? Actually, we see four views here, but I'll explain that in just a second. Um, so the properties tab is used to showcase properties of an object uh, that is currently selected or if nothing is selected of the camera itself. Then you have the layers tab, uh, display tab, grasshopper tab, and notifications tab. If you don't see some of these, or if you see some other stuff that uh, other names for these tabs or other icons, then you can easily um, add or remove sub tabs from here by just clicking on this uh, gearbox icon here, right? It might be a little bit different for uh, Mac users, but at least for Windows users, it's the same thing. Mac users will uh, be able to find it uh, as well. It's, it's just, it might just have a different icon. So if you click that uh, gearbox or gear wheel uh, icon, then here you can see all of the additional tabs that you might want. For instance, uh, what would be a cool one? Uh, sun, sunlight tab, right? So you can turn on the sun and it, you can do analysis, uh, you know, sun analysis here. Well, not really sun analysis, but at least you can lit the scene. Uh, for now, I don't, I, I don't really need it. So I'll just click on it uh, or rather click the gearbox, gear wheel and untick the sun tab. So here you, ju you should just find um, properties, layers, display, and other two are unnecessary. So property layers in display. Oh, actually, sorry, sorry. Uh, if you are a new user, you should also enable the help tab. And I'll explain why in just a second. Oh, that doesn't help. <laughs> that just opens up the help folder. Sorry, help tab is here, not in the do uh, not in the bottom, but right here, help tab. There we go. Uh, let me close the stuff that it opened. There we go. Okay, so properties um, and layers. Here we have the layers tab. It works in a very, very similar fashion as uh, uh, the, the AutoCAD layer system. And we will be working with layers throughout this whole course, right? And I will be explaining what it does in just a second. Right now, it's just to show you what's where, right? Then you have the display tab where you can change the different settings of the current display. We don't need to mess around with that. Basically for you uh, as a beginner um, in, in, in Rhino, you just use properties and layers, right? Then here in the bottom, or actually I should probably talk about the, the views, right? So to, to be able to talk about the views, I need some sort of an object, right? So, so that you can actually see the object in the views. So let me, um, let me click on this cube or, or on this box tool here, click on it. And then you can see here in the command line, it tells me what I need to do, right? To actually create a box. So it asks me in bold letters, it asks me for first corner of the box. And then here underlined, I have different options on how I can create a box without giving it the first corner, right? So there are like, uh, in this case, one, two, three, four, five, five different ways of how you can create a box. And the default one is that you first give it the, uh, the, the, the bottom, uh, bottom left corner, I believe, the first corner, right? So in the, in the perspective view here, I just click anywhere on the screen once. And I can see that I can drag out or not drag out, but just by moving my mouse, I can 
uh, start creating the base for my box, right? So I clicked once and now you can see in the command line uh, that it changes from the first corner to other corner or length. So I can either give it another corner or I can type in the length. In this case, I'll just click uh, once more, click. And now it asks me for the height, right? So I can, again, either type in a number or I can just click third time, right? And that's a box is created, right? And if, if I use the scroll wheel, I can zoom in, uh, sorry, zoom out, zoom out, zoom out, zoom out, or zoom in in every uh, viewport. So these guys are called viewports, right? And they show the same thing, right? They, they, they show the same uh, 3D model, only from different views. And by default, you have the top one, the front one, right one, respective one. If you need the back one or the bottom one uh, or, or the what's opposite of right, the, the left one, uh, then you would need to change the view of these viewports. Uh, and I'll show you how to do that in a second. So let's go through navigation first. To navigate in a view that is non-perspective, so by non-perspective, I mean, um, sorry, non-three-dimensional pro projection-based view, just like an AutoCAD, like 2D view. Uh, so top, front, and right are two-dimensional views, while perspective is three-dimensional view. To navigate in the top view, for instance, um, scroll in, scroll out, right, zoom in, zoom out, that's easy. Um, and then if you right-click and drag, Right click, you know, that either mouse button. If you right click and drag, you can uh, pan the view around, right? So you can zoom out, pan the view, pan the view, zoom in, pan the view, pan the view, right? Pan the view. <laughs> uh, same thing with front view, same thing with right view, right? So you can position your element uh, quite, quite neatly there. With perspective view, uh, scrolling the scroll wheel is quite the same, right? Zoom in, zoom out or rather zoom out, zoom in, in this case, right, zoom out, zoom in. Um, but you can also, if you right click and drag, it only rotates the view, right? It doesn't pan the view. So holding right mouse click and uh, dragging will rotate the view. But if you hold down shift key on your keyboard and you uh, right mouse click and drag while holding the shift key, then it will pan the view, right? So that's the difference. If you want to pan, you need to hold the shift key. If you don't want to pan, just rotate, you don't hold the shift key, you just uh, right mouse uh, click and hold and, and drag. Most of the time, the way I like working is, especially if I'm on a laptop, I don't want to see four views at the same time. That's a little bit, you know, the screen real estate is a little bit pricey on, on the on the laptop. So I want to have one of the views maximized. The way you do it is you double click on the name of the view, right? So if I double click perspective, it maximizes it. If I double click it again, if I double click it again, there we go. It minimizes it or not minimizes it, but uh, it starts showing you all other views as well. So you can do that with any view you want. Right? Quite useful. Um, now, shading settings, right? So actually, uh, to, sh to fully show you the, all of the different shading settings, let me just create another box here, and this time I'll just move it down. So I have one box laying on top of each other, like so. And let me maximize this. So you can change the shading settings, the way the geometry is being previewed in every tab, right? That's, uh, or sorry, in every viewport. Uh, but here I just choose perspective because it's most informative, I think. By default, uh, it will show you a wireframe view, meaning like uh, only lines, right, for, for your geometry. But if you know that, you know, a box, it, it does have a volume, right? It does, it, it's, it's a three-dimensional shape. So it must have some sort of other ways of shading it. And it actually does. So if you, right next to your viewport name, which is called perspective here, there's this small uh, arrow, right? If you click that arrow, it will expand a menu for that uh, particular viewport, 
right? So that menu will have, uh, first of all, it will have all different shading options for your viewport. You might not see very interactive, that's fine. But all other ones are going to be uh, present. So if I just change it to shaded view, voila. Oh, actually, you might see it a little bit different. Uh, or no, no, never mind. You will see it uh, just like that. Let me just uh, real quickly ignore this. Please ignore this part. Okay. <laughs> I just changed uh, the previous settings to be default ones, what you would expect to see, you know, just from a fresh copy of Rhino. Uh, so this is the shaded view. It will uh, have a, like a rudimentary sh uh, shadow system and so on, but nothing too fancy. But it really helps uh, in understanding the three-dimensionality of your objects. And 90% of the time I use shaded view to uh, 3D model and inves investigate. Then if I right-click uh, the perspective view again, oh, by the way, sorry, you don't need to just click on the small arrow there. You can also right-click the, the name of the viewport. If I right-click it again, I can go to rendered view, for instance, and it will show a slightly like nicer, I guess, image of it. Uh, my experience is that it's not really uh, convenient to 3D model with, but uh, you know, when you're adding materials and so on, it might you know, become convenient. So that's rendered view. Then you have ghosted view. Ghosted view is, oh, there we go. Ghosted view is basically shaded view with a little bit of X-ray, right? So you see the backside of the geometry as well. So that's the ghosted view, nothing uh, special about that. If you're doing a lot of complex stuff, then uh, ghosted view does become quite useful, but for simple stuff, you don't need it. Then you have X-ray view which uh, basically the lines that are in the back of the geometry will not uh, be diluted. They, they, will, uh, they will have the same intensity as the lines that are in front of the geometry, right? So I'm not sure why X-ray view would be useful. I never use it. Technical view is, uh, I don't know, it, it cute, I guess, but uh, I don't use it at all. Artistic view is just completely obnoxious and it doesn't even load for me. Hello, are you going to crash now? Oh my God, oh, there we go. So that's artistic view. Uh, no idea what, why would anyone want to use that. Uh, then you have pen view, quite the same thing as artistic view, so just, you know, quite kitsch. Uh, and then you have arctic view, which is, it's, it's very similar to, rendered view, only that arctic view is, uh, it doesn't transfer, uh, I believe it doesn't transfer color information as well as it doesn't transfer texture information. So if you have textures attached to your 3D objects, they will not show up in the arctic view, which will make uh, the arctic view much more diagrammatic. Also, it's much faster in showing complex geometry. And that last one is ray traced. So ray traced is uh, like a fancy version of rendered view, and you will not need to use ray traced. Also, it's very bad with uh, Rhino 6. Uh, it, it will become quite, quite good with Rhino 7, but in Rhino 6, it's pretty bad. So I just immediately changed to, sh uh, changed to shaded view, and uh, we will be working with it most of, the, of this course. Okay, enough of that. In the bottom here, you have snapping options. Um, actually, you might not see them. So let me turn everything off. Right, right at the bottom, can you see it actually? Yes, you can. Okay, right at the bottom, you see C plane, X, Y, Z, millimeters, default layer, and then a bunch of buttons that you can uh, toggle on or off, and then some statistics of the, mo of the model of, of, of the um, 3D file how much CPU does it use, and uh, no, all of that jazz. So, I will not be talking about C-plane, we don't, yeah, 
just let's ignore that this exists, uh, we can talk about millimeters, right? So this says what kind of units are you currently using in your 3D file, right? So now I know that I'm drawing everything in millimeters, right? If I want to change it to something else, if I want to change it to meters, then uh, just like in AutoCAD, I will need to type in units into the, the, the command line. You type in units, you hit enter, it opens up this menu here where you can just change it from millimeters to meters. Hit OK. It will immediately say that you, know, you have some geometry that was drawn in millimeters and you're now changing everything to meters. Would you like to you know, actually keep the size of the geometry as if it, it was in millimeters, right? So you, would you like to scale everything down? Um, I'll just say no, <laughs> you know, uh, depends, depends on um, if you were drawing the geometry as if it was meters and then you noticed, oh crap, I'm doing it in millimeters, uh, I'm actually doing it in millimeters and you change, you then want to change it to meters, then you hear you press no. But if you were drawing it in millimeters and then decided that ah, I might as well start drawing everything in meters, but the scale of the geometry is correct, then you do scale it, right? Here I just drew a few random boxes, so I don't care, so I'll just hit no. Okay, so now everything is in meters, right? Then we have um, the currently active layer, which is called default, and it's black, right? So if I go to the layers tab here, in the top uh, right, or right-hand right side, if I go to the layers tab, I can see that indeed, I do have one layer that is black, and that uh, is my current layer, right? Okay, uh, we don't have any additional layers, so we don't care. Um, and then you have these buttons, grid snap, ortho, planner, object, object snap, uh, smart track, gumball, record history, filter, and that's it. Um, so in terms of filter, never have this on, always have this turned off. So this is turned on, this is turned off, right? You don't care. Uh, filter will basically not let you select some things if it's uh, if you have some of these things unticked and you don't want that because that will po pose a lot of problems <laughs> later on. Uh, then you have record history. Record history, uh, it's an advanced thing. Uh, if, if you want to keep uh, your model quite parametric, then you can record history, but I wouldn't suggest you use that. Uh, especially if, if this is your first rodeo. I personally never use record history in my uh, career, I guess you could call it. Um, then one very important one is gumball. So with having it turned off, if I select this object and I actually want to move it, I, I can, you know, I can click on it and drag it, but it's very uh, uncontrolled. The, the, the movement is very uncontrolled, right? I don't really know what kind of direction I'm moving it in. I can kind of guess, but everything, um, let's say I want to move it right to that corner, for instance, or no, a better example, I want to move it uh, to the, uh, along the X axis of the world, right? So here in the bottom uh, left corner, you can see X, Y, Z axis, right? So let's say I want to move it along the X axis or rotate it in some way. Um, I can try, you know, to have it as aligned as possible, but it's always going to be, you know, it, it's not going to be precise. That's bad. By the way, control Z to undo, but that's, you know, I assume you know it by now that control Z is undoing all of the programs. Uh, if I have Gumball turned on, and I select the object, these arrows appear. And not just these arrows, but also these arcs, and also these rectangles, rectangular pieces. In your case, the gumball might be smaller, I just made it bigger so that you guys can see better. But you have the arrows, you have the arcs, and you have these uh, rectangles with a dashed line, and everything is attached to the center of the geometry. So let's start with, actually, let me delete that one. Um, so select and hit delete. Uh, let's start off with arrows, right? That's X axis, and I can just click on an, uh, click and drag on an arrow, and it, the movement gets locked 
to the x axis, right? So I can move it just in one direction. Same thing with a y axis. Same thing with x axis, right? That's cool. Um, one more thing is if I click on an arrow and I type in 10 and hit enter, it will get moved by 10 meters. Oh, so this is a big box. Okay, so it's uh, it will get moved by 10 meters. Same thing for every other axis, right? Um, now these arcs are rotation, right? So the same thing with uh, just like with movement, I can click and drag on the arc so I can rotate it around the X axis. I can rotate it around the Z axis. I can rotate it around the Y axis, right? Also same thing as with uh, movement is that I can click on an arc and I can type in, for instance, 45 and hit enter. So it gets rotated 45 degrees along or around that particular axis. Shouldn't do that. Edit, redo. Oh, nothing to redo. <laughs> Control V. Okay, <laughs> we're back. Um, last one uh, or last bit of the gumball that is useful is scaling, uh, which is these uh, rectangles here. So again, they work exactly the same way as, as the rotation and movement. Uh, so I'll, I won't go through all of them, but just let's say X axis, click and drag, scale or stretch the object in one direction. If I select or if I click on the rectangle and I type in 1.5, enter, it's going to become 150% of its original size in that particular direction. What if I want to scale the whole object around its center point uh, in, uh, in all directions, right? I can do that. I can do that by holding down the shift key and clicking on the... So shift key is important, holding it down and clicking on the rectangle. And then if I type in, let's say three, enter, all, uh, the, the object gets scaled uniformly in all axes three times, right? X3. Um, right, so that's that. One more, uh, one last thing, I guess, with the gumball is the Alt key. So Shift key will scale, uh, scale it um, in all directions. If I hold down the Alt key and I, let's say, click on the X axis and drag, I make a copy. If I hold down the Alt key and I click and drag on the Z axis, I make a copy. If I hold the Alt key and I click and drag on um, an arc, I make a copy. Alt key and using one of these tools will make copies, right? So you keep the original. All right, delete, delete. So that's Gumball. Then you have smart track. Smart track is something that actually um, right now I went f back to fourth, right? So for, from filter to record history to gumball. Now let's actually jump back to the beginning to grid snap and talk about that. So I will delete the box for now and I will turn on grid snapping to just show you what it does. Right? Grid snap. And I'll try to create a box again, right? So box, box tool here, or you can type in box. Actually, I should show you commands. So type in box, enter, same thing as, as clicking the tool. Now with grid snap turned on, if I zoom in, you can see the grid, of course, on the screen. See how my starting point snaps to the grid points, right? So that's what grid snap does. I absolutely hate it <laughs> because uh, usually you don't really work within a one by one meter grid. You always have things, you know, uh, 1.1 meters long, 1.2 meters long, you know, uh, different lengths. It's never this kind of a very uh, strict snap. So grid snapping will force the, the object to be snapped to the points of of the grid. I 
always have this turned off. If I, and if I see a student who has it turned on, I turn it off for them. Grid snap off. Ortho snap. So all of you know this from uh, AutoCAD. Ortho, or orthographic snap is uh, 90 degree angle snapping. So for uh, ortho snap, uh, for me to show you, actually, let's enable it. By the way, it's the same um, key bind uh, as in AutoCAD, F8, right? F8 enables it. So to enable a ortho snap, I just press F8 or I just click it here in the bottom, whichever is more convenient for you. And now uh, to actually show you how ortho snap works, uh, let's draw a polyline. So polyline tool is here, or you can write polyline, enter. Let's start drawing a polyline, right? So now with ortho turned on, I can only draw it at 90 degree increments. Yeah. Right? Like that. Uh, if I have it turned off, then it's, you know, kind of whichever angle I want. Um, okay, there, there, it's a problem that I can't uh, click on the end of it, so I will not be closing this, this curve. Um, there is one thing about ortho snap that I quite like. So if I have it turned on and I right click it, I can set the ortho angle, which I really enjoy. So set ortho angle. Here in the command line, it asks me to give it a new number. Right now it's 90 degrees. What if I give it 30 degrees? Enter. And I select these curves, delete them. So I gave it 30 degrees. Now I take the polyline tool again. And now notice how it snaps at zero, at 30, at 60, at 90, right? So now it's snapping every 30 degrees, which means I can do much more uh, fun stuff with it. Right? Up. Mm, let's do something like that, that, that. Oops. That. Uh, maybe goes back here, moves here, moves there, there, finish up there, right? So much more uh, control over the angles while I still retain the possibility to have uh, the snap at 90 degrees, right? Quite useful. Uh, then we have planner snapping. Planner snapping means that um, anything that we create um, is going to be flat and is going to be laid on this. Uh... Wait, is it going to be laid on, on the ground? I'm not sure about it being laid on this grid, but or rather the plane of this grid. Just imagine that this grid is infinite, right? Oh, that's an important thing to note. Um, imagine that, like, if, if this grid was shown infinite, it would be very, like, intense uh, visually. So it's not being shown infinitely. But just imagine that this grid kind of goes on forever. And this is your world uh, zero, zero, zero coordinates and like the starting point and also the elevation. That's the zero elevation of your world, right, in the 3D model. So planner, I don't remember, sorry about that, but I don't remember if it will force the geometry to be on the world plane, but at least it will force the geometry to be, uh, the, the lines, for instance, to be flat as they are being created. Um, it's sometimes useful, but honestly, uh, I will show you a trick later, uh, later down the line that I prefer to use rather than this tool right here because it might mess you up more than it will help you. So I turn this off. Now, next one is object snap, O snap. Absolutely the same thing as in AutoCAD. Actually, for this, let's, um, I can, can I show you all of these? 
Yeah, I can show you most of these in, um, in a two-dimensional view, in top view, just like in AutoCAD. And it works the same way in perspective. So I'll just show it here in the top view. So double click on the name, double click on the top view name here. So um, let me turn off all of the snapping, like so. And let's look at, uh, let's go through this real quick because I, I don't want to spend too much time here. Also, it's getting dark, so let me turn on the light. Um, Pulse-line tool is a little bit boring. Let's do a control point curve, like an herbs curve. I'll explain the difference later on, but you'll, I think you'll notice it immediately. So let's use the, um, this tool right here, NURBS uh, uh, curve tool. Click on that. It draws exactly the same way as a polyline tool would, so don't worry about it. So if I don't have any snapping turned on, and I just draw a curve, well, I do have orthographic snapping turned on, so let me turn that one off as well. I just draw a curve, right? Something like that. Oh, here I can actually close it, that's nice. So here I can close it, but uh, I wonder why is it snapping that way? It sh usually shouldn't even let me uh, close it. Apparently this one does, but wait. Will Polyline tool let me close it? Oh, it does, okay, that's nice. Uh, that's a nice little thing that they added. Uh, before you couldn't even uh, close the Polyline tool. So back to the curve tool real quick. Sure, something like that. Um, Endpoint snapping is, if I turn this on, um, and I want to draw from either this point or this point, these are the endpoints for a curve, I can by just, let's say, let's do a circle, right? I'm just going through these real quick. Uh, so let's do a circle, um, and I can just click, uh, or rather hover my mouse over the end of the curve, and you can see that it immediately snaps to the endpoint here. If I have... Let me jump to perspective view and create a box real fast, like that. If I have a box and I want to also draw a circle around one of the corners of the box, I can with the end point tool here, right? Snaps to the corner, I can draw curve. Uh, why is this? Uh, just a second. Radius, okay, there we go. So you will see it like that. Um, so I can draw the curve around any kind of geometry, actually. I can also draw a curve uh, around the points of, of the box. So corners are, or endpoints are you, uh, like initiated by the end snap. Then, let's go back to the top view, then you have near snap. Near snap, if I turn it on, and I also want to create a circle, um, if I hover my mouse down next to any kind of geometry, it's going to find the nearest point. Either be it an edge of a box, it's not going to find the nearest point on the surface of a box, but on the edge, right? Um, so it still needs like line information. So if I hover my mouse next to it, I can just kind of create a circle from the point that was found here, which was the nearest point on, on the curve, right? Uh, nothing fancy. Point snap is basically, well, right now we don't have any points. Uh, let me just create a few. So you can create a single point with this tool here, point. I think that doesn't have any length, any volume, any anything. It's just a single point, you know, in, in the system. So uh, usually they are used as helpers uh, to, to help you guide the geometry, but never used as geometry itself, right? Because it's not geometry, it's just a point. It's a, a zero dimension object. So a point, if you want to create one, you do single point. If you want to create multiple, you right click this, uh, this tool here, multiple points. Pop, 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 pop. Or you can just type in uh, either point to create a single one, and then the, your command immediately stops after you click. Or you can type in points 
to create, create multiple ones and then the command stops when you press enter. Press enter when done. Right. So now if you want to snap to these points, you need to have point snapping turned on and then let's draw ju just some circles around them. Just like that. Oh, uh, by the way, uh, enter. <laughs> yeah, this is important. Enter repeats the last command used. So if I do a circle, I, uh, and I finish the circle tool and then I hit enter again, I can draw another circle. Enter, another circle. I also have it binded to my right mouse click, so that's why you won't hear me uh, press enter too much. Instead, I just uh, right mouse click um, to create the, 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 the circle. Or rather, not to create the circle, sorry, to repeat the command. Okay, so that's snapping to points. Then we have midpoint uh, snapping, so that's basically there's a line, midpoint snap turned on, you hover your mouse next to the line, nearest, 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 bam, midpoint. Right? So the circle that you, you I have just created now is going to be located right at the middle of this line. Right. Same thing would happen here if I just hover uh, my mouse over this line somewhere here. Ah, there we go. Somewhere here, right here is going to be the center or the middle of this line. Okay, uh, center point snapping, uh, center object snap. So if I have, let's say, a closed geometry and right next to it I have an open geometry. So to close geometry, you just kind of, uh, sorry, to close a curve, you just, uh, once you finish drawing it, you just click on uh, the last point that you put as you're drawing the a closed curve is going to be at the start of the curve, right? So I have two curves here. One is closed, one is open. I have center point snapping turned on. I will get my trusted uh, circle tool here and I'll try to uh, find the center point for this particular uh, curve and it doesn't find it, it, doesn't find it here as well. Okay, let's figure out why. I will turn off all other snaps except the center point snap, center object snap and try again and it doesn't find it. And why doesn't it find it? Let me think. That's strange, it should find it. Let me try one more thing. Uh, perhaps uh, the NURBS curve, it, it doesn't like the NURBS curve. Don't look at this. <laughs> Don't look at me doing this. Let's try again. Oh, it doesn't find it as well here. Okay. What about circle? It does find it in the circle. That's strange. So this is a new behavior that I haven't noticed before, but it does work with a circle. So it does find the center point, like it, it is able to snap to the center point of a circle, but it is not able to snap to a NURBS curve. I can swear that this wasn't the case before. Let me try one more thing. A hexagon. It does find the center point of a hexagon. Okay, but what if I do, uh, sorry. What if I do this to the hexagon? It still finds the center point of a hexagon. So that means any polyline should work. Oops. Uh, Okay, so it does work with every and any closed polyline as long as it's closed, but for some reason it doesn't work with a NURBS curve. Let's try again. Yes. Hmm. Hmm. That is. Uh, yeah, that's that's something strange. Strange going on there, but either way, it does work with uh, circles, ellipses, uh, and whatnot, and also it does work with any kind of polyline. Ooh, which means that if I take this guy and I rebuild it again, don't watch, don't don't look at this. So I rebuild it into this, and then I take this. Yeah, then it works. Huh. 
Okay, live and learn, I guess. So this is something new uh, to investigate further. Okay, let me turn on all of the snaps back on. So we are at center. Intersection object snap is pretty simple. Curve, curve, circle, right in the, you know, it, it finds an intersection between two curves, so I can just draw a circle on that point. So it basically can snap to these kind of intersections here, and now it can snap to these intersections here. If, wait, why does it, do? something's fishy. Is this because of, uh, because of that? Or is this just uh, Rhino being overwritten by too many, oops, by too many, yeah, okay. So that's the case. So the reason why this happens, like why some snaps don't work, is because if you have too many of the of snaps turned on, some of them will take over and will not let weaker snaps um, take place, right? So for instance, here I had all of the other snaps turned on, so intersection snap sometimes worked, sometimes didn't, right? Right now when I have interse intersection snap turned on, uh, ju just intersection snap turned on, it works uh, like nothing. Like it, it works for every, in every occasion, right? So that's good. Uh, Rule is only use snaps that you currently need. Don't have all of them turned on, you will have a very bad time if you do it, do so. Perpendicular snap is we have a line, we have another line, and it comes in at 90 degrees angle, which is going to be a perpendicular snap. Right? Uh, tangent snap is we have a circle, and we want to draw a line from here that kind of aligns or, or, or uh, connects to the circle seamlessly. Let's say I want another one. I want another one. I want another one. Huh? Another one? There we go. Right. So that's, that's how, uh, how, how this works. Uh, let me just check one thing. Trim. Um, num, 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 so I can trim this off. So it goes here. Yeah, okay, that, 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 that kind of works. Something like that connects seamlessly. That's nice. Uh, that's tangent snap. Uh, quad snap is every object has, uh, or every circular object has four points that are aligned with X, Y, and uh, Z coordinates, or X and Y coordinates, uh, and you can get first quad, second quad, third quad, fourth quad. Exactly the same thing as in uh, AutoCAD. Then you have knots, uh, which is uh, somewhat like a, a change in uh, curvature in a curve. So from degree three curve, you move down to degree two or degree one curve. Um, so basically, let's say you have a continuous curve and then it makes a break and then kind of continues on as a, continu uh, as a, like a curvilinear curve, then uh, with not snap you can kind of co uh, snap to those, those moments. Uh, I will not, uh, we don't care, we don't need it. Then you have verte vertex snap, which is only used on, <clears throat> apologies, it's only used on meshes, which actually, um, connects nicely to what Rhino is. Rhino is a NURBS surface modeler. Uh, what does that mean? Well, NURBS, uh, there are two types of geometry. Well, actually there are three, but let's just say there are two types of geometry. There is NURBS based geometry and there is mesh based geometry. So stuff that you see in video games and movies uh, like special effects in movies um what, what else oh my god yeah like animations and stuff like that all of that stuff is meshes right it's it, it's mesh geometry the way meshes work is you basically have a bunch of triangles or rectangles 
Well, first of all, you don't have triangles and rectangles. Yeah, I need to be pedagogical about this. Uh, you have a bunch of points, right? So you have a bunch of points here, right? And all of those points have uh, some sort of a um, number attached to them, and that's their index number. So uh, what I'm seeing is that you have a... Can we... Wait. What I'm saying is that you, uh, you can have a list of points, right? And point one, it has x, y, z coordinates, you know, that it's attached to, basically, wh where is it located? Point two has x, uh, y, z coordinates as well, and it kind of goes on, right? You have uh, point three, point four, point five. Uh, so let me just change those real quick, point three, point four. This is what happens under the hood, uh, you know, in, in the computer, right? When it's uh, when it's trying to understand what the, you know what kind of geometry does the mesh have. So, by the way, we are talking about mesh geometry in brackets, SketchUp, 3ds Max, Maya. Uh, blender, um, what else, what else, what else? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm missing a bunch, but uh, all of these programs use mesh-based geometry, even though SketchUp kind of lies about it, but it still meshes. Um, okay, so we have, first of all, we have a list of points, right? Just points flying in space, and for instance, this guy right here uh, has like, let's say, uh, its x coordinate is minus 1.6, its y coordinate is 28.3, uh, and its uh, z coordinate, well, it's flat on the ground, so its going, the z coordinate is going to be zero, right? And all of them have these, these coordinates, okay? Then we have another list. So that's the first list. It's uh, all of the points, they have their own little numbering, and they have their coordinates. Second list is, a uh, list of faces, or rather, I, I should call it face information. And every face also has its own little number attached to it, but the, the way it's described is it can be either T or Q. Uh, so right now I'll just give an example as triangle, and um, actually to give it more cleanly, um, let me write some text here in, in Rhino. Uh, one dot. Okay, so let's let's say that's point number one. Technically, it should be point number zero, but uh, let let's ignore that fact. Uh, in 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 uh, in programs, you count from zero, not from one. That's fine. Bear with me so far. Um, I'm going to be as fast as possible. Okay, so you have point one. Let's say this guy is going to be point two. Uh, this one is going to be point three. Uh, that's going to be point four. That's going to be point uh, five. That's going to be point six. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, they can be, you know, other way around. It doesn't matter where, where, which one is which. Right, so we have those points, and the face information. The way it works is, it says, okay, first, uh, it first determines is it a triangle or a quad. A triangle is a face that has three points, right? A quad is a face that has four points. So let's say um, it 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 says that it's it, the first face of a mesh is a triangle. Uh, that uh, li lies between, or that is located between point one, point two, and point four, right? And then the second, or rather, let's do the first one. So triangle one, two, four, right? If I take my uh, polyline tool, I can draw that uh, that triangle here, right? So let me go to 
snapping options and choose point snap so that I'm able to snap to these points. And let me just draw one, two, four, right? This triangle right here has been made. Okay, then the next one, let's say, let, let's do something else. Um, or actually, let's do one more triangle. Triangle between uh, two, three, and four. And then let's do a third one, which is going to be a quad between four, three, five, and six, right? So that's face information. So triangle between two, three, and four, like that. And quad between four, uh, uh, what was it? Four, three, five, six. Four, three, five, six. Notice how I messed up here? And it sometimes happens with meshes that you actually want this to be a rectangle, a rectangle but since you didn't uh, use the correct, or the program didn't use the correct sequence of numbers, this happens. So let me go back here. There are, of course, ways of how to, um, how to mitigate that and fix that and check for that. Um, instead, let's do 4, 3, 6, 5. 4, 3, 6, 5. Four, three, six, five, close. Okay. We have a mesh. Well, it's not a mesh right now. Uh, it's actually three separate polylines. But we do have like a representation of how a mesh geometry would look like made out of these six points that are connected with three lines, uh, three um, faces. Uh, and actually, I can show it here. So yay, we, we have created this kind of a mesh, right? Uh, so basically those points that uh, I was talking about, vertex snap, will, uh, with vertex snap you'll be able to um, snap to the points of a mesh, right? Um, why can't you just use point snap? Because uh, points of a mesh are called vertices, not points, and those are two distinct, two different things. Now I'm just showing the vertices as if they were points. Um, all right. So all you need to do to determine a mesh, to describe a mesh, is our two lists of things, right? One list is points, the other one is information on instructions how to assemble those points into geometry. And if I uh, just run some sort of a real quick Google search for you, mesh geometry. If I just show you like a Google search of mesh geometry, you can see here all of the, you know, yeah, sure. Triangles and quads, right? Uh, ev ev everywhere. Where here you can mostly just see triangles. Uh, but yeah, for instance here, quads, right? Um, so everything is triangulated. Uh, so th that's how meshes are made, and again, meshes are used in video games, in the movie industry, in special effects, and all of that jazz. It's also used for vis visualization and uh, to, to kind of create pretty pictures, basically. Uh, the reason why there, there's a... Hmm. Maybe before the reason, I will uh, explain what NURBS surfaces are, because Rhino is more focused on NURBS surfaces. So NURBS surfaces are, imagine that there's, um, let me just quickly, real quickly, create something like that, build, uh, like that. Like that, and... Oh, that's ugly. Rebuild again. And yeah, that's a bit better. So imagine the surface here, right? You could kind of say that, okay, I can uh, replicate the surface as a series of triangles, right? Uh, something like, well, something like this, right? I can replicate the surface as a series of triangles, but you can see that the for some reason, uh, this is much smoother than this one. Well, you could be uh, more specific about it and series of very small triangles. Again, not small, oh, come on, tri triangles. 
So you could say that uh, this is, by the way, an error surface, this is a mesh. So you could say that uh, I can just use a series of small tri triangles to replicate the geometry of an error surface. But actually, in, in truth, if you zoom in close enough, you will still see you know, the resolution. At, at a certain point, the resolution will fall off, right? And you will start seeing individual triangles and discontinuities. Here, the resolution is perfect, meaning that, um, that the geometry itself doesn't, it, it has infinite resolution. So that is a NURBS surface. Um, the reason why it has infinite resolution that is that this is a mathematically based surface. Uh, from high school, you remember like F2x equals um, x times x divided by 15 multiplied by uh, multiplied by y blah, blah 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 you know you remember these formulas right so it's quite the same thing here with this uh, particular surface it's just that to describe the surface you need a much much longer formula and you also need to restrict it within certain boundaries which are described by these curves right so you have additional formulas like f2x uh, describing one curve f2x describing another curve and it just really quickly becomes um, like a lot of math and a lot of stuff for the computer to process what you get out of it is a perfectly smooth surface right a surface that has infinite resolution and that can be used for machining, uh, automotive design, uh, architectural design and so on, right? Because you can zoom into it as much as you want and it will still have perfect resolution. The problem with it is that it's heavy, it's real heavy. That is why it cannot be used on um, like in, in the movies or in video games and so on just because you can't uh, you can't operate with these geometries at the same speed as if uh, you were doing it somewhat manually with a mesh, you know, with just two lists. So that is uh, what Rhino is. Rhino is primarily a NURBS surface tool which deals with infinite resolution and the output of Rhino is used for production, right? So it's used for making things, making physical stuff and also simulating stuff and so on, but we'll, you, you'll see it in later courses. Um, right, so it's not that great at animation or stuff like that, but it's really good for precise, uh, precise modeling, right? Okay, that was hard, <laughs> that, that was a lot. Go, st stop, uh, pause the video, take a breath stretch a bit we will continue in just a second I'll, I'll have a sip of my smoothie okay all good all ready let's continue so mm, well maybe i'll need the notepad let's continue with um, with some examples maybe Mm. Let me <clears throat> quickly create a bunch of layers because by, by now you kind of know the user interface. <clears throat> so let's actually do some work here um, or, or not work, but rather let me show you how layers work and then we will begin actually working on the project. So. Here, as I already told you, there's the default layer, right? If you want to create a new one, you just click on the new layer icon here. New layer, and then you can call it any way you want. Um, I'll call it my boxes. My boxes, enter. Right? And actually, let me um, make this my boxes layer, my current layer. So, how do I do that? I double click on it, not on it, sorry. I double click on. Um, Oh, I don't need to double click anymore. Cool. I just single click where it says current. I just click there and it becomes my current layer, right? So the tick mark appears right next to my, my boxes layer here. 
All right, so we have that going on. Then you have uh, option to turn it on or off. You don't have the option to do that for your current layer, but you have an option to do that for any other one. So let's create more. Uh, new layer, I'll call it my curves. New layer, oh, new layer, I'll call it my um, surfaces. Whatever, right? So let's, uh, I always like to color code things and I, sh I think everyone should color code things. So let's add color to these layers, right? So let's say the default layer can stay black, that's fine. My boxes layer, I'll make it red. So you just click on the color uh, rectangle here and it will open up this select layer color tool. And then you just kind of drag this, this guy around or you can move around here um, around the circle and click anywhere on the circle or you can just uh, select a color from this list whichever you want so red color perfect my curves should have a blue color and my surfaces should have a beautiful green color very natural okay so let's uh while i'm in my boxes layer <coughs> or actually uh, a better example uh, as I'm in my default layer, I will create, so I, I just click on the current and I make default layer the active one. I will create a few boxes. So it doesn't, you don't, don't care what kind of size it has, just a few boxes. Box one, box two, box three. Right? So I have three boxes here. If I want to move these boxes into a particular layer, I can do that by selecting all of them. So, um, by the way, it works the same way as in AutoCAD. From right to left, it will select everything that the... If you click and drag from left to, uh, right to left, it will select everything that the that is inside of your rectangular mark tool and also stuff that the rectangular mark tool touches. If you select from right, uh, some from left to right, right, it will select only stuff that is inside of the rectangular mark tool, but it will not select the stuff that is not completely, you know, inside that just is being cut by the rectangular mark tool. So same thing as in AutoCAD, right? Okay, uh, so I'll select everything. Also, to select everything, you can do Control A, but in this case, I'll just do it like that. I'll go to my layers, I'll right click on my boxes layer. So just right click on it, change object layer, bam. Boxes are now in the red layer that's called my boxes. While we're at it, we can uh, turn it off or on. So this is hide, unhide, right? And you can lock. So you can't, you know, if I have it locked and I try to select it or do anything with them, I can't because they're they're locked or you can unlock them. So now I can. Okay. Again, you can change the color of them. Right. Mm, and there's a bunch of other stuff that you can do, but I will cover that stuff later on during our actual project. Um, so now let me create a few curves. Or actually, I should probably just move, uh, like make my curves the active layer and actually uh, just create the curves in that active layer. Maybe some polylines. Maybe some circles. So those are my curves and they are already in my uh, blue layer and then my surfaces which I can uh, just use the surface tool here, right? So probably before we kind of finish up this introduction uh, let's move through uh, let's move through creation of geometry, right? How to create geometry and how to modify it. Uh, so I have my three layers here and here I have them set up in a way that I have my curves, my surfaces, my boxes, right? Technically, I should have one more layer that's called my points. So does anyone know why? 
and I, I'm now talking to a recording, right, to a video recording. So of course, no one will be able to tell me, but just think about why am I setting up this uh, it this way for this particular tutorial, not for the project, but for this tutorial. I'll have another sip while you think. Good answer. So the reason why is because points are zero dimensional, right? They don't have a length, they don't have width, they don't have height. Curves, polar lines, well, technically circles uh, as well, arcs and, and whatnot, they're one dimensional. They have a length, they don't have a width, they don't have a height, right? But they do have a length. Then surfaces are two dimensional. They have a width and a length, they don't have a height. And boxes, well, I, I should call it my volumes. That's boxes are technically volumes, but you know, volumes co contains more. Uh, so my volumes, like the vo volumes uh, such as boxes, spheres, cylinders, uh, torus, knots, uh, uh, what else? Pyramids. Did I say pyramids already? I don't know. Um, ellipsoids and, and, and whatnot. All of them have three dimensions. They are three dimensional objects, right? Length, width, height. So I'm going to show you how to create all of these objects starting from zero dimensions ending with high dimensions, uh, with three dimensions, right? So let's start. Uh, and we will cover most of this uh, left-hand side menu by, by the end of it. So here on the left-hand side menu, first of all, you have the mouse, right? Mouse is basically cancel and just, you know, you just have a mouse there. Uh, that's, that's boring. Um, then you have zero dimensional object, point, multiple points. I already covered those. I will not be doing it again. Then we have polyline, which is basically, right, you already know how to draw a polyline. Um, you can make it quite nice. Uh, you can ma make a closed polyline by just drawing, you know, from start to the, uh, the end needs to end where the start was, right? So you kind of end the curve where it started. Uh, so you draw a polyline. All right. Um, then you have NURBS curve uh, tool here. Oh, important thing. Notice how there is uh, these small triangles right next to, uh, right, right below the icon of the tool. Those are important. If you click those, they will expand all of the different ways. Oh yeah, sorry, I did it too fast. If you click on that small triangle, it will give you this menu, and if you click and drag on this uh, gray uh, bar here, you will have that menu just floating around, and you can kind of close it and do it again. You know, it's not going to get lost or anything. Let's make it bigger. So here are all the different ways of how you can draw a curve, right? You have the NURBS curve, you have the interpolated point curve. The difference between them is um, actually pretty, pretty straightforward. Let's do it in two, uh, like in two D view, in top view. For instance, uh, let's first draw some sort of a guide. Let's draw a polyline that is doing a zigzag, and maybe it ends here. Right? We have this polyline. And then let's, uh, I will break my, uh, <laughs> my layers because I want it to be in a different color. So I'll just choose my volumes layer. Uh, I'll just call it, I'll choose my red layer. And I'll draw uh, the first one, which is the same one as, as if you just click on, uh, on this icon right here, which is called the NURBS curve or control point curve, right? I'll click on it. I'll start drawing from the start. I, for that, I need endpoint snapping to be turned on, and I just draw it. Click, click, on the same corner points as the polyline. So that's how a NURBS curve looks like, right? Why does it look like that? Well, uh, the explanation is both simple and hard. 
<clears throat> the simple version is imagine this just <coughs> imagine this um, polyline uh, and imagine uh, this kind of a procedure you take this polyline and you draw a cur uh, a pol another polyline on top of it but the way that you draw it is um, you turn on end snap and midpoint snap and you draw uh, from its start to the middle point of its first segment to the middle point of its second segment middle point of its uh, was it middle point of its third segment I don't remember anymore fourth segment fifth segment and you end it there no that's not true I don't remember <laughs> or was it thirds I think it was in, uh, to, we need to draw it in thirds so from there to there to there yeah, so we, we need to do the same thing, only draw it in thirds. Oh my god, M messed it up uh, already. <laughs> so we start from here, We uh, and for this I'll just use the near point snap. So that looks like a third, so that's one third. That's the second third, then we jump to the first third here, we do the second third here, uh, we jump to the first third here, we do the second third here, first third, second third, uh, first, third, uh, second, third, end, right? So this is first iteration of us doing it. Then I delete it. Uh, well, I shouldn't delete it. I should just say that this one is like the, the first iteration. Let me move it to the side. And then we kind of repeat it again. But this time around, I know that here I have a, a, a point already, right? So I, I need to be uh, quite quite mindful of it, and I need to do do it like so. First, uh, I might be wrong about this though. Like that, like that, and then first, second, third, uh, first, third, second, third, first, third, second, third, first, third, second, third. Yeah, like that. Yes, okay, so that is how, oh, well, close enough, um, how it should look. So this is first, uh, iteration zero, iteration one, and this is iteration two. So notice how we are slowly smoothing it out and we're moving towards this NURBS curve here. Uh, with, with a little bit messed up ending, but uh, you get the picture, you get the idea. Uh, this was not very precise of me to do, so, uh, but it's it's basically math, right? And if we were doing it, that, that kind of subdivision and smoothing and subdivision and smoothing according to the thirds of, of the uh, input polyline segments, uh, if we did it infinitely, uh, infinite amount of times, then we would end up with a NURBS curve, this guy right here. Uh, which also has the control points here, but the control points are detached because of smoothing, right? And also what it has is infinite resolution, again, just like the surface. Okay, then we have control uh, interpolated point curve, which is the next item here. And if I draw the same one through the same points, you will immediately understand what it does, right? So I just drew this one. It forces the curve to go through the points that you uh, that you click on, right? So that's that also might have some some uh, benefit in, in certain cases. So those are curves. Um, then you have an interpolate curve on the surface and so on. You have a bunch of stuff here. I will not be covering most of it. Uh, let me just quickly go through it to see if there are any really important ones that we should cover. Well, twin between two curves is pretty cool. Um, so let's say we have one curve that's doing this, something like that, and we have another curve that's doing something like that, right? Something like this. And we want to create a curve in between them. That's neither this nor that, but it's an average between this curve and this curve. We can do that with tween between two curves tool. So if I click it, 
uh, select start and end curve. So I select this one and I select this one, right? And here, where it's, uh, w once I have both of them selected, it will start going for the next step. So here, I just need to change the number to one. So I click on the number option and I change it to one. And here you can see the average curve. If I hit enter again, voila. This one is somewhere in between this curve and this curve. And it's only possible to do it, I, I believe, only with NURBS curves? No, no, never mind. Forget, forget what I said. But this is a very neat, neat tool. Okay. Actually, one more thing. Uh, tween curves. So the uh, command for it is tween curves. Uh, this one, this one, uh, number uh, 25, let's say. You can do 25 <laughs> curves in between, right? So it becomes uh, quite, quite nice. Okay. So that's, uh, those are curves. Then circle is pretty straightforward. You can start drawing a circle and you can type in a radius of it, 50, enter. By the way, when you draw a polyline, you can also do, uh, you know, you start drawing a polyline and let's turn on ortho snapping. So you can type in uh, 10 or bigger number 50, click, 50, click, 50, click, 100, click, 100, click, and end the power line, right? So you can type in stuff. Uh, always, always, that's the rule. Always check what the command line wants you to do, right? And then you will see what are your options. One more important thing is the help tab here that I didn't cover. If I, uh, for instance, want to use some sort of tool, but I'm not sure how to use it. Uh, for instance, the NURBS curve tool, right? Qu control point curve tool. If I start running it, the help tab will update and it will explain everything that you need to know about the NURBS curve. It will show you animations on how to draw a NURBS curve, how to select it, how to edit it, and so on. So you can just follow that uh, instead of me. <laughs> Okay, um, we have a few more tools here with two dimensions. So we have ellipse, uh, we have arc. So ellipse is just basically instead of one um, radius, you just give it two radii and you get an ellipse. Um, arc is just basically uh, you start, you give it a center, you specify from where do you start, you specify where you end and you have an arc. Um, Rectangle tool, um, same thing as box tool, only that you stop, you stop at a certain point, right? You don't. Oh, by the way, notice how. Um, let me go and jump back here. Uh, with rectangle tool, uh, right now I have snapping turned on or ortho snapping turned on, so it doesn't follow my. Um, it it kind of snaps its proportion. That's because ortho snap is turned on. If I turn it off, then I can do any proportion I want. That's also important. Okay, so those are like ways of how you can draw the, the different stuff, and that's like two 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 dimensional. Uh, oh yeah, uh, last one is polygon tool, where you can just uh, it, it draws exactly the same way as a circle would, right? Only that here, where it says number of sides, as you start drawing it, it will ask you for number of sides. You can specify, uh, for instance, octagon, so eight sides, right? So you draw an octagon. Cool. Um, and then you have uh, curve editing tools, right? So by default, the, the one that is mostly used is fillet curves, but there's plenty more to kind of work with. So I will uh, explain this through a prism of, uh, of AutoCAD, right? Uh, so similar tools from uh, to AutoCAD. So let's say we have two curves. If we use fillet, fillet tool on them, uh, and we specify, we don't specify a radius, so radius is zero. And I click here and click here, like click on the first one, click on the second one, it will just fillet them to a corner. 
Let me control Z to undo and enter to repeat the fillet command. If I specify a radius to be 50, click and click, it will fillet them with a radius of 50, right? But notice how this curve here, this curve here, and this curve here, they are still separate curves. So that's not good. Uh, I will have radius set to 50, but also I'll make sure that join is set to yes. And I'll have this curve here, this curve here, filleted. And now if I select it, it's a single entity. It's a single piece of geometry because they got joined into one piece. What if you don't want to have them joined? Well, you can explode them. Type in explode. Well, select it and type in explode. And now it's going to be disconnected, right? If you change your mind and you actually want to have them joined, you can select all of them and type in join. And it's going to join into a single curve. Easy. Okay, so that's fillet. Uh, what else is there to, for, for me to show? Chamfer is whatever. Fillet corners. Actually, fillet corners is kind of nice. I, I really like using fillet corners. So if we have uh, some sort of a uh, let's do something like that real quick, like that, and that. Okay, if we have some sort of a shape, right, that we drew, and we want to round off all the corners with the same radius, we can select the shape and type in fillet corners and hit enter. And then it's going to ask you, okay, what's what's the radius? What, uh, what kind of radius do you want? If you have radius that's too high, for instance, 50, some of the corners will not be filleted just because it couldn't fit the, the arc there, right? So you need to do something uh, like, you need to use reasonable numbers. So let's say 10, right? And that's how you do Apple design, right? <laughs> You just fillet everything. Um, right, so that's fillet corners. Quite useful, quite nice. Uh, works on polylines, works on rectangles, works on anything you want. Uh, what else? Mm. Okay, let me show you two more and then the rest we will do during a project. So if I have a line and I want to offset it, I just use offset, oh, not offset surface. So be mindful of what you type, right? Offset, just regular offset, distance uh, 50, click on the line and then you just choose which side to offset and you offset it. Same thing as is shown in the video here. Okay, so offset is that. <laughs> there are of course options for offset to offset it uh, to both sides in the same, you know, at the same time and uh, how should it treat corners. For instance, if you, if you have this kind of a uh, shape here and you want to offset it, uh, if the corner is set to sharp, it's going to look like that. If the corner is set to uh, round, it's going to look like that. If the corner is set to smooth, well, it kind of looks the same way. Actually, let's check round. Okay, so round adds an arc, a smooth corner creates a nerves, uh, nerves curve, um, and, and so on. So you can change the corners of how, how, how you treat the offset. Uh, what else? What else? What else? Everything else is fine. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I think everything else is fine. So that's it about curves. Now let's move to surfaces. Um, the default behavior, or for that, we actually need to go to perspective view. Um, Default behavior of surfaces uh, or default tool with creating surfaces uh, surface from th uh, three or four corner points, right? So if I click this, it will ask me to give it the first corner, click, 
second corner, click. Third corner, click. Fourth corner, but wait, are you lying to me? Because you said surface from three or four, so I should be able to do it with three. So actually you can. So I, now I just gave it three corners and if I hit enter, it's going to finish up as a triangle, right? If I repeat the same tool and I actually give it click, 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 four corners is going to make a rectangle. Well, that's pretty, you know, boring. It's, it's just a surface, right? It's just, no. but yeah, um, it's, it's the most basic one. Really useful though, uh, you would be surprised. Then we have, um, so notice what I did there. Uh, I also clicked on that small triangle in the bottom left and expanded this um, tool set for surface creation. So for surface creation, um, we already covered the surface from three or four corner points, but here we have a bunch more that I want to uh, cover. So surface from planar curves is quite important. Um, let me show you, show you an example. We have a curve here, right? It's a pretty curve. It's a flat curve. That's the important thing. If I select that curve and I click on uh, surface from planar curves, it creates a surface within the curve. Okay, now show, let me show you all of the ways how it doesn't work. Let's say a curve is open, right? So computer doesn't know what's inside, what's outside. I select it, I click on select, uh, I click on surface from planner curves tool, or the shortcut for it is planner SRF. SRF stands for surface. Click it, no faces were made, curve must be closed and planner. Doesn't work. Okay, what if we do have a closed curve like that, but you kind of messed up and one of your uh, control points of the curve is slightly up. Oh, I should explain this. Uh, no, first let me show you. Let, let's say, uh, and then I'll explain the control points and, and so on and whatnot. Um, so you have your curve and one of the points is moved up, so it's not flat anymore, right? It has, a, it has this kind of a arc to it. Select it, planner SRF to make it, make the planner surface. Nope. No faces were made. Curve must be closed and planner, right? So those are two, two ingredients to making a, a, a planner surface. It needs to be flat, it needs to be closed. Uh, that the curve needs to be flat and closed. Okay, so now back to the control points. Every time when you select an object, you will see these points here, right? These are the control points of, uh, of a curve. Uh, you also have, for a surface, you won't see them immediately, the, the control points, but if you press F10, you will see the points in the corners here, or, oops, uh, redo, there we go. You will see the points in the corners. If you want to get rid of them, you just hit escape <clears throat> and it gets gone. Uh, if you can't use F10, then the, show, uh, the command for it is points on, enter. Same thing as F10, points on will show you the points. Uh, what can you do with them? Well, you can select, for instance, this point right here, and holding down the Shift key, I can select the second point, so you can add things to selection holding down the Shift key, uh, and I can move them up, for instance, right? two of them up. So it does this kind of a geometry. It's always nice to do. Uh, with a curve, you can select this point here, for instance, move it around, Know, posi reposition it and then so on. So it's just a nice, nice little, uh, nice little way of, of, of messing around with, with geometry. Um, right. Surface from network of curves. I will not cover that. Loft. I can. Uh, I can cover that actually. So loft works with uh, either only using open curves or using closed curves. Right. It, you can't pair 
open and closed curves within a loft, but let's say I have this curve here and I want to make a copy of it a higher up, right? So I will select it, holding down the Alt key, I will drag it up by the Z vector, Z axis, I guess, uh, so I have a copy of it. Alt key makes a copy. Uh, so I have that done. And I want these two curves to be different, right? So I'll take, uh, let's see, this control point here. Um, I'll just move it somewhere here. I'll take this control point here and move it probably here. Whatever, right? So I have these two curves. Okay. What if I want to create a surface between them? Well, I can, uh, and that's loft, right? So I select the first curve, I select the second curve, and I type in loft. There's a bunch of options for loft. I will not go into them. Just use normal loft for now. And I just hit OK. And I have a surface between the two curves. Let me delete it. Um, what if you want to have more than two curves, right? So let me do three um, like that. And maybe this one is somewhat here and a little bit rotated. You know, so, 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 something like this. Well, maybe that's a little bit too much. The surface will look really funky if I do that. So, something like this, right? Sure. Select the three curves, type in loft, and it's going to create a loft for you out of those three curves um, easily. So you can have any amount of curves. The only thing that you can't have is, let's say in the middle, I want a circle, right? So it's a closed curve. Select these three, loft. Enable to loft, select either open or closed curves, but not both, right? So it doesn't like it. If I have uh, one circle here, let me delete those two curves. Uh, if I do have like a closed uh, circle here, circle, circle, so I have uh, three circles and one of them is smaller, and the other one is, is kind of rotated in a weird way and kind of extended and moved around and I loft them. It, it is going to work, right? But uh, it doesn't work with open and closed curves at the same time. Getting very dark. Wait, it's possible for me to make this a little bit... Eh. Eh. Come on. That and bam. Okay, that's good. That's good. So, that's loft. Um, then you have patch. We will cover patch in just a, a, a bit with, with, uh, during part two of these tutorials. Um, so we don't need patch just right now. Um, vertical plane, cutting plane, blah, 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 extrude straight. Well, we can do extrusions. Yeah, let me do extrusions and then uh, everything else I will cover during the, 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 the next stages of these tutorials. So extrusions work with either surfaces or curves. Uh, in this case, I will use curves for them. So let me just draw like a zigzaggy boy here. Something like that, and let me draw another one that is just uh, a closed blob, right? So I can select uh, one of these and I can click on extrude straight and just kind of extrude it up or down. So you kind of understand what it does, right? Uh, I can type in 10, so it extrudes exactly 10 units, in this case 10 meters upwards, right? Here I can extrude it uh, by 50, so it extrudes by 50 meters upwards, right? Easy. Um, right. Just like with... Uh, hmm. I will skip the surface tools for now, I think. Let's just see. I will actually show you one tool and then skip all the other ones and we will come back to them in just a bit. But uh, one tool that is quite interesting and that I really enjoy using is uh, Rebuild. So let's say with, the, with a curve, 
right? I have a curve, right? And I, I drew it with one, two, three, four, five, five points, right? What if I have, want to have more, more control points to use? Well, first of all, uh, I would suggest you not having to, uh, like always have the minimum amount of points because uh, you won't be able to control what you do if you have too many. But let's say in this case, um, the points, uh, I want to have more, right? I want to have more points. Then I can do rebuild, <clears throat> rebuild, use rebuild on this curve, which asks me to give it a point count and give it a degree. Those two ingredients, right? So point count is basically how many control points do I want to have? So I had five, I say, actually I want like 10, I, I want twice as much. And then degree is the curvature degree of the curve itself. Okay, so write this down. Degree one is polar lines, straight line segments. No arcs, no nothing. A polar line, a chain of straight line segments that have sharp corners is degree one. Degree two is a chain of arcs that connect seamlessly to each other, right? That's degree two. Degree three is a NURBS curve that I kind of showed you all, all this time, how, how to draw, and it, it, it has perfect um, resolution. Yes, it has perfect resolution. So out of these three degrees, and there's all, of course degree four, five, six, and so on, but all of those are just mathematical, uh, like, um, like mathematical curves. You don't care about those, you care about one, two, or three. While degree one and degree two can be exploded, degree three cannot. Because degree three has infinite amount of resolution, that means if you explode it, you would end up with infinite amount of uh, segments, which would break your computer, right? So here I can say that I will, uh, and, and here it does actually say degree three, right? So that I drew it as degree three and now it's rebuilding it into degree one. So it's, it rebuilds it into a pole line with 10 points. No, I want it to be also degree three. So not to mess up. Okay. So we end up with um, the, the yellow curve that you see here is the original, the red curve on top of it is the new one, right? So you can see that there's going to be uh, a bunch of gaps and so on. So it, it does change the form of the curve, right? But I'll just hit okay. There it is, it's rebuilt and it has now 10 control points so it can have more, um, more control, or, or in some cases less control, actually, in uh, uh, changing it. Because more points doesn't necessarily mean that uh, you'll be able to, you know, kind of fully control how those points behave and how those points work with the curve. Okay, so that's with the curve. Uh, with a surface, it's also pretty easy. Let me just create a four-point surface. Click, click, click. Right. Rebuild. And the only difference between the curve rebuild and the surface rebuild is the, that you have point count in U and V direction. By the way, U and V is like X and Y. Think of it this way, right? So you have you know, one direction on the surface and you have another direction on the surface and you kind of specify how many points you want in each. And then degree in one and the other direction you might think, oh, how, how the hell would it look like as a single um, first degree surface? I'll show you. Uh, but before we do that, I will use, uh, let's say six by, oh, let's do four by four points and three by three um, degree curvature. I hit okay. I hit F10 or I type in points on to get the control points. And now I can mess around with, with these points as I please, right? 
Easy. Okay. So actually, let me show you how, how it would look like as degree one surface rebuilt. Uh, to get rid of the control points, by the way, I pressed escape. Uh, so rebuild. I stick to four by four, but now I will use degree of one by one. It okay? That is how it looks like with degree of one by one. Right? All of the cross sections of this are polylines. All right. So that is that. Um, let me get rid of this. Whew. Let's continue. Almost there. Almost finished. <laughs> so the next one is box. Uh, well, not box, but uh, solid tools, uh, solid creation, right? So for uh, solid creation, I also expanded like so. You can create a box, you can create a cylinder, you can create a sphere, right? So box, I already showed you how to do it. Click, click, click. Cylinder is basically you first draw a circle or you can type in, you know, uh, you can actually do do this. So bah. you can do this. You select a circle, a cylinder tool. You just say from where you want to start drawing and you type in uh, 25, for instance, or uh, 10 for the radius. Click and you type in uh, 50 for the height. So now you know for, for a fact that your circle is um, 10 in radius or 20 in diameter and uh, 50 in or 70, I don't remember what kind of number I used in height. Um, with a box, it's kind of the same thing. You just start drawing it. By the way, if you want to start drawing it from zero, uh, zero, zero, zero coordinates, you, when you select the box tool, you type in zero, enter, and it will start drawing it from zero. And then it asks you for corner base or length, so or length, meaning that you can type in some sort of a length that you want. So I'll type in 10, enter, width. I need to type in width, so it's going to be uh, 50, enter, and height, uh, 10 again, enter. So I make this brick, actually, <laughs> actually pretty close to this one. Um, right. Uh, sphere is most boring, you know, like very generic uh, way of drawing a sphere is just center point radius, 25, enter, you have a sphere. A uh, sphere uh, according to diameter, same thing as sphere according to radius, that's whatever. Then you have ellipsoids, that's uh, boring, cones, why would anyone want to make a cone? Pipe is kind of nice. Um, if you have a curve and you select it and you use pipe tool or you just type in pipe, enter, then you need to specify the pipe radius. So let me do like 10 by 10 and just draws a pipe for you around the curve. Actually 10 was a little bit too much, 5 by 5. So when I say five by five, I mean five at the start and five at the end. If you want a different start and end radius, you do uh, five by one. And this you create something like this. Right? By the way, Arctic view uh, would, would show it like that, which is nice, I think. Anyway. Uh, so that's pipe. Uh, maybe one last thing. Um, yeah, uh, one last thing about solids before we move into Boolean operations is if you have, let's say, a curve, right? A closed curve and you extrude it up and you want this guy to be a solid because right now it's not, right? Right now it's a single surface. If you want it to be a solid and you know for a fact that the top and the bottom are flat, then you can select it and you can type in uh, cap, like a hat, cap. Enter, 
and it's just going to create a, uh, like a surface at the top and then the bottom. It basically just uses the planner surface tool, right, to, to create the top and the bottom surface. Quite useful. Um, that's just a small tip. Um, so now let's go to Boolean operations. And out of all of these Boolean operations, or solid tools, how it's called, uh, I will just show you first, first two, actually. Yeah, first two. Uh, all other ones are a little bit too niche for my taste. Uh, before we do that, uh, there's one more thing that I just remembered. It's, it's a lot of um, these small tools that I really want to show you, but at the same time I know that uh, we can't have a five-hour tutor introduction tutorial, right? But one quite nice thing that I really enjoy is Chamfer Edge tool. So Chamfer Edge only works on where two surfaces meet. So here we have one surface here at the top and one surface going around the perimeter wrapping around the perimeter and one surface here in the bottom, right? So this edge right here is where those two surfaces meet and this edge right here is where the bottom and, and, and the surface meets. So in general, this shape is called the polysurface, right? Multiple surfaces joined into one form is called the polysurface. And basically, you, as long as you have a polysurface, you can uh, chamfer the edges to make them a little bit nicer. So let me actually show you the, not the rendered view, the arctic view, the arctic view of this, and it looks like that, right? Uh, in reality, nothing is perfectly sharp. Like you never have a perfect corner. If you look at the corner of your table, if you look at the corner of your, I don't know, your screen and so on, there's always a small either chamfer or fillet on that corner, right? Later on for rendering, that is going to be a key thing. Right now it's not, but I just want to show you one tool that I use to, to make it nicer. Uh, and that is called chamfer edge. Chamfer edge. Enter. It asks me to select edges to chamfer, so I can click on my shape here. Oh, actually, I first needed to specify the chamfer distance. So I'll hit, hit escape to cancel the command, and I'll do it again. Chamfer edge, enter. Then I click on next chamfer distance, uh, you know, to, to specify the, 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 the angle, or, or not the angle, the distance of the chamfer. So let me say uh, two, I don't know. I have no idea how big this thing is. Well, I can kind of guess according to grid, because that is two. Uh, so this is a pretty big object. So I'll use chamfer distance of two. Um, select edges to chamfer now, this guy and this guy here. Enter, enter, wait for it. There we go. It's chamfered. I don't know, I, I kind of like it, like for, for, for design purposes, I kind of, let me change this to Arctic view. For design purposes, I kind of find it useful, this chamfer distance thing. You might not, but um, it's it's a matter of, of uh, style, I guess. Okay, so now solid tools. We have Boolean union, Boolean difference. There's also Boolean intersection and Boolean split. I will not be covering those, only Boolean union, Boolean difference, because those are the most useful ones. So Boolean union, let's say you have one closed polysurface, meaning a polysurface that doesn't have any openings, such as this. A polysurface that has an opening, just a second, there we go. A polar surface that has an opening looks like that, right? So this one would, it doesn't work with solid tools. Uh, for, for stuff to work with solid tools, it needs, uh, stuff needs to be completely closed, like components uh, that you use need to be completely closed off. Uh, so we have this uh, polar surface here, and we have, uh, let's say a sphere here. 
I just draw a sphere, right? So I have two geometries that are intersecting one another, right? The, the thing about it is that if I zoom in into here, I can really see, or actually we can just do it this way. Uh, ghosted. There we go. I can see that, you know, even though visually they look like they're kind of joined up, they are not. They are two separate geometries, and that is problematic because that is a very shitty way of, of, of making a 3D model. Uh, you will have a lot of problems if you don't 3D model cleanly. So we need to either join them up, depends on what you want to do. Let's say we want to join them up. If you want to join them up, you do Boolean union, right? So you select the first shape, you select the second shape, or you just kind of drag and select both of them, and you click on Boolean union icon here, or you type in Boolean union. And one shape carves out the other one, and both of them get joined up perfectly. Okay. Next up is Boolean difference. Let's say I have another, uh, another sphere, right? And I create it around this point and I make it big like that. And I want to carve out my this, this shape with this sphere. Well, I can do that with Boolean difference. So I will run Boolean difference first, Boolean difference. And uh, look at what it asks me from the command line. Select surfaces or poly surfaces to subtract from. Okay, from here. Press enter uh, to continue. Okay, so I select it and hit enter. Select surfaces or poly surfaces to subtract with. Uh, with this guy. Press enter when done. Enter. It doesn't seem like anything changed. And that's because uh, this sphere is still present, right? Actually, let me sh change this to shade it too. It doesn't seem like it did anything because this sphere is still here, right? But if I move it away, now I can see that this sphere was used to cut out a, 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 a hole, not a hole, but a negative space inside of the shape, right? So I end up with something like this. I just deleted the sphere, by the way. If I check it in the Arctic view, looks like that, kind of nice. Rendered view, looks like that. Actually, why does rendered view... Ew, okay, that's disgusting. Mm, which one was it? This one. Okay, let's jump back to shaded view. So that's that. Um, chamfer edge, let's jump back to chamfer edge again. Chamfer edge does not work always. Let me do it again. Chamfer, uh, chamfer edge, let me do it again. Chamfer distance two on this curve here or on this edge here and these edges right here. Do you think it's going to manage? I don't think so. Enter, enter. It actually did, uh, you know, it did it, yes, but did it do a good job? Uh, no, that is not a good chamfer, right? So it actually, I'm surprised that it managed to do it, but uh, it it's not it's not great, not great at all. So the more complex the edge the harder time chamfer will have in, in, in chamfering it, right? Uh, at a certain point, it will completely break, break apart, and it will completely, like, stop working. Not the rhino, the tool uh, on, on that particular edge, just because of the complexity of the edge itself. Um, right, so keep things clean. Um, right. One more thing, and we will finish. So let's say you have drawn some sort of a curve, right? And then you have messed it up. Yeah. 
accidentally or not accidentally, but you know, it's definitely not a flat curve, right? And it's floating somewhere away from, from here. Um, and you actually want to, you know, you, let's say you were working on it in top view and it seems to you that it's uh, flat, but then you look at it in perspective view and you go like, oh, sh oh crap, you know, that's bad. So you want it to be flat. The tool that would do that, that would make it flat, is called uh, project to C plane. So let me explain how it works. You select a curve, you type in project to, and it will immediately ask you, do you mean project to C plane? Yes, yes you do. Project to C plane. It will ask you also, would you like to delete input objects? And in this case, I will choose no, but usually I choose yes. It basically, would you like to get rid of this one, uh, the, the, the original one? So I'll choose no, enter, and my curve gets projected right on the C plane, and now it it also becomes completely flat, right? So now I can make planner surface out of it. So that's quite useful. Also, um, what else? Uh, the, the, while, while I was typing project to C plane, you probably noticed, or maybe noticed, uh, that there is a tool that's called project. Well, what that tool does is, let's say we have a surface, like that, um, F8, F10, and I just turn on points on and just do something like this, just to have some curvature on it, and then in the top view, I will draw some uh, some sort of a curve here. I don't know what it is, but I drew something, right? Some sort of a curve. If I look at it in perspective view, well, that's not good, right? I, I want the curve to be on the top of the surface, right? Uh, to make it, to force it to be on the top of the surface, first of all, I'll move it above the surface. And then I will use a tool that's called project. Project. I will select uh, select curves and points to project. So I'll select my curve. Right. Enter. Select surfaces to project onto. I'll select my surface. Enter. And it's going to take that curve and it's going to push it straight down uh, and, and project it on this surface. You might think, what, what, why would I need that? Well, uh, what would you want to do with it, right? Well, one thing is that now I can use this curve, right? I can select this curve and I can type in, or uh, I can first type in trim or later, it doesn't matter, but I can use a trim tool. Just like in AutoCAD, by the way, trim, enter, and it will ask me to select the object to trim. So I'll just click on either inside of the curve or outside of the curve to trim away the surface, right? So I end up with something like this. That's quite useful, right? By the way, trim works with, uh, I probably should state this. Trim, enter, select cutting objects. This guy is going to be the cutting object, enter. Uh, select uh, object to trim, click, trims away, right? That's how trim works. While we're at it, uh, if you have something disconnected like so, extend, uh, select boundary objects. This is my boundary, enter, select curve to extend. I click on this one gets extended. Same thing as in AutoCAD. I'm trying to not repeat stuff from AutoCAD. All right. Uh, I think that is it. Um, if you... Okay. No, it's not. <laughs> well, last thing. Before trimming, I can also... Uh, instead of trimming, I can also use to uh, choose to split. Split. Works with curves, works with everything. Select objects to split. I will select my uh, shape here, this rectangle, enter. Select cutting objects. I will select my curve. 
enter. So now what it does, it splits the, the, the form into two shapes. So what can I do with it? Well, I can, for instance, say um, that this surface right here needs to be extruded. Extrude SRF. Enter. Needs to be extruded up uh, by 5. Enter. And thus, I, I give it thickness, right? And this one gets extruded down by one, right? So now what I made is I made this kind of slotted mechanism where this thing can move, that this object that has a thickness can move through this object that, that has a slightly different thickness. You know, add a person there and you have a, have a pavilion. <laughs> anyway, um, I think this is it. If I'll remember some things, I will cover them in a later tutorial. But as an introductionary tutorial, I think this is, uh, that's that. Of course, there are many, many other tools to look for, uh, to use and so on. I, um, I will not be able to cover all of them in, in a single week. Uh, but we will do our best to at least give you a short introduction uh, of this program. All right, so now let's move into actually creating a project, right? Because that's what it's all about. So I always begin by, and you should as well, uh, by importing data from the site or from the client, whatever you have. Right. So in this case, <clears throat> we have prepared. Um, can I show you here? Oh, other screen. Uh, we have prepared a DWG file, like an AutoCAD file that you can download, um, and it's going to be an AutoCAD file of the site. So if you go to the uh, course website and you scroll down here under Site CAD file, you'll see the AD10 Site 2D DWG. Right, so this is, um, I have already downloaded it, it's right here, and this is uh, the a, a very simplified version of what kind of a site data you would expect to get from either a site survey or a client. Usually it's much more convoluted, I have cleaned it up drastically for you. So now let's see how can we import 2D uh, drawing from AutoCAD into Rhino. To do that, you can either straight up drag and drop it in, but that is a little bit, you know, uncontrolled. Or you can go to File, Import, go to Downloads, or wherever you have that file downloaded, select it, and hit Open. It's actually quite, quite the same thing uh, as if you were drag and dropping it in. So here uh, you get your import options, and I would suggest uh, not changing them too much. Um, just make sure that model units and layout units are the same, um, have the same units, right? So here I am drawing, uh, like my, my new file is created in millimeters, so I'm working with millimeters. We will change that to meters in just a second, or maybe centimeters, we'll see. So going through these settings, import uh, unreferenced layers, import unreferenced blocks, blah, 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 all of this, just keep it as default. As, as a beginner user, later on, you'll, um, you'll be able to uh, customize these settings. But for now, default ones are fine. Uh, hit OK. <clears throat> and there it is. You have it here. So let's, uh, as you can see here, it's completely flat. So let's look at it in the top view instead, right? So here, if I check the layers, I can see that there are indeed layers that uh, got imported as well, not just the geometry. And the geometry is tied to those layers, so I can um, hide, unhide separate aspects of it. Right? So what you see here is um, trees, 
right? You see the ISO lines, and you see, or um, sorry, not the ISO lines. Well, they are ISO lines, but uh, landscape contour lines. And also you see the elevation above the sea level of these contour lines. Um, again, this is super simplified, and usually you will have something a little bit more, um, let's call it a little bit more tricky to deal with. Uh, but in this case, uh, it's good. Uh, it's, it's fine for, for to, to get the point across. So now you can see I'm trying to select stuff, but I'm unable to. And that is because my layers, like these layers, are locked. right? So I will unlock them to be able to select them. And now I can select whatever I want. Right? So those lock marks here, are uh, they, they mean you can either select stuff from the layer or you can uh, un uh, or you cannot select stuff from the layer. Um, so where do we start? Well, we start by uh, measuring the, the site, right? Me measuring the, the distance between, let's see, this point here and this point here and seeing if the distance is something that is reasonable, that we are in correct dimensions. So to measure stuff, you just type in distance so the shortcut for it is not shortcut, but uh, command for it is distance, enter, and you measure it from, so basically it just asks you to click on two points, right? So you click on this corner point here. If you can't select that corner point, make sure that end snapping is turned on, click, and then click again on the other side. And here in the command line, you will see that the distance is 50 millimeters. Well, that's not true. We want it to be meters, right? Not millimeters. So this tells me that the while my file is in millimeters, this drawing was made in meters, meaning I need to either scale this up a thousand times to convert from millimeters to meters and still keep drawing in millimeters, or I just change my units to meters. And I'll probably do the unit thing instead. Right. So let me type in units, enter. So this document properties tab comes in. And then model units, I will just change this to meters. And hit OK. It will ask me, would I like to scale the model? Uh, so if I don't scale the model, what was 50 millimeters will become 50 meters. If I do scale the model, what was 50 millimeters will stay 50 millimeters. So uh, the, the, the side size will stay. So of course we want this gap, this distance to become 50 meters. So I do not scale the model. No. There we go. Visually nothing changed. But now if I measure distance again, from this point to this point, I can see now it says 50 meters, which is much more reasonable, right? Considering the, the site. So now uh, on to the next big thing that we need to do. And it's actually making a 3D model of the site. Well, actually one, one more thing. I really hate how these uh, layers look like. So I will rename them. I will double click on the, <clears throat> sorry. I will double click on the name of the layers and I'll rename them one by one. So ISO curves, which is the gray layer, is going to be landscape contours. Then markups is going to be elevation text, the red layer, right? These numbers here. Then border is, yeah, going to be border. <laughs> you know, it's, it's this rectangle right here. Sure. Side drawing markup tree is going to be markup tree. Oh, it's going to be the trees. Uh, trees. Okay. So we have four layers here. And I want to kind of make them a little bit um, not more convenient, but cleaner. Clean them up, right? In, in this view here. I want all of them to be paired into one group that would be called uh, site 2D drawing or something like that. So how do I do that? Well, I need to create a new layer. So I'll click on new layer. And I'll call this new layer uh, site drawing. Enter. So I have a new layer that's called site drawing. 
And basically what I'm going to do is I'll take, the, for instance, the landscape contrast layer and I'll drag it in to the side drawing layer, like that. I'll do the same thing with elevation text. I'll drag it into side drawing, border, drag it in, and trees, drag it in. So now you can see that this is uh, the parent layer and th these are children layers, right? Which means I can um, minimize the parent layer and I can work with it globally, right? So I can hide all of its child layers, I can lock all of its child layers and so on. It just helps with navigation, especially later on when you'll have 100 layers or maybe even more. Okay, so we have that done. Now let's uh, create a three-dimensional landscape from this. So for that, I don't really need the trees right now. So I will hide the trees layer. And all I care about is having the contours at correct heights, right? Because right now they're all uh, flat on the ground, right? But I want them to be in the correct height. So for instance, I know that this contour right here is half a meter higher than this contour right here, right? So I need to move them up by uh, in increments of half a meter. So let's do that. Uh, this is manual work, which uh, can be later at later stages of, of, of your education can be somewhat uh, automated. But honestly, for something like this, I just kind of spend the time and, and just do it uh, manually. So how do we do that? I will find the contour that has the lowest number, uh, lowest elevation, which is going to be this guy, 173, I believe, 174, 178, yes, 173. And I will say that this contour is actually like, since it's the lowest one, it's going to be the one that's that stays on the ground. Everything else moves by half a meter, by a meter, and, and so on, right? So what I'm going to do is I will, uh, select the first contour, which is 173.5. Click on the Z-axis arrow. Make sure that gumball is turned on, so you see the Z-axis arrow. And type in 0 0.5. Enter. And you can see that now it got moved up by 0 0.5 meters. Then I'll take the 174 one, and I'll move it up by 1 meter. And I'll kind of keep repeating it for uh, all other ones. 174. 4.5, that's going to be 1.5 meters above 173. 175 is going to be uh, 2 meters. 2.5. 3 meters. 3.5. 4. 4.5. Five. Okay, so we have that, and then we still have some islands here. So this one is 174.5, while our zero is 173. If we subtract it, that means this is 1.5 meters, 1.5 meters higher. And this one is 175, which means it's two meters higher, like that. Okay. So now we have the correct uh, height information of our landscape. Um, there are different ways of how we can do this. So one of the ways you might think is, well, we learned how to loft, right? So that means we can kind of take pairs of these, uh, of these layers and start lofting them. That's going to be a little bit tricky. Uh, it's, it's not going to like that uh, so much. Um, you might want to make the layers or make the curves um, uh, smoother, right? To, to smooth them out. And the way you do it is by introducing um, degree three rather than degree one. So again, from, from previous uh, talk that I gave, uh, you remember that since it's a polyline, it's degree one curve. It was if it was made out of arcs, it would be degree two, and if it's made uh, if it's a continuous, perfectly curvilinear curve, it would be degree three. So I want all of these contours. 
Let me select them. Actually, let me show you a trick. So if you want to select everything in one single layer, you go to landscape contours layer, because that's what I want to select, right click on it, and you choose select objects. And it will select all of the objects in that particular layer. And then I will use rebuild, rebuild command on all of them, enter which uh, basically tells me, uh, well, gives me this, this uh, option box or on how I'm rebuilding it. So the yellow or, yeah, that's yellow. The yellow lines are how it was before and uh, br uh, not brown, gray, gray lines are how it is after rebuilding, right? So this is a little bit too wonky. Oh, by the way, the red lines are the biggest gap between the original and the rebuild, right? So you can always check for where the biggest gaps are. So this is not precise at all, right? And it's not precise because under point cloud, where it says 30, that means we start with 30 points, but we, for some reason we end, well, we don't end, but we are rebuilding it into 10 point, uh, 10 control point curve which we're reducing resolution basically, right? Uh, we don't want to do that. We will do 30 points as well. And now notice how the curve stays much closer to the original one. There are still, of course, there's always going to be gaps, right? But now it's much closer. Let me do more. Uh, so let me do double that. Let me do 60. And with 60, you can start noticing that um, the deviation is minuscule, right? Um, it's actually, it, it says here, uh, maximum deviation is 0 0.29, so 30 centimeters, which is uh, fine, it's, it's okay, right? For, for this example, it's okay. So make sure the delete input is turned on and then just hit okay to rebuild them. So now you have perfect curves, right? Curves that don't have any sharp corners. Okay. Trying again to loft, for instance, these two guys here, loft, will pose the similar problem, right? Of, of uh, the loft kind of breaking here and not, not working properly. Uh, you could mitigate that with other tools such as sweep uh, or uh, sweep between two rails, but I would not suggest doing that because you will still have a lot of problems here with these islands and so on because this curve is closed and this curve is open, meaning that um, neither loft nor sweep will work on both of them, right? So you'll need to like figure out some sort of other way on how to do it. Instead, I would suggest using a command that's called patch. So patch is the only command in Rhino uh, in surface creation uh, that is not precise. It's, it is still perfect, like it has still perfect resolution and so on, don't get me wrong, but it is not precise in the way um, it calculates, right? Because you deal with resolution during calculation. So let me actually, instead of telling you, let me explain, uh, let me show you. By the way, we don't need the numbers anymore because we used the numbers to move them up, so I'll hide the numbers layer as well. So let me select everything in landscape contours layer, like that, and let me use patch. P-A-T-C-H, patch. Enter. It will give me, uh, again, settings for the tool to, to use. So sometimes if, if there's too many settings, it's going to appear as a separate box. If there's not a lot of settings, it's going to appear in the command line, right? So keep an eye out for that. So patch, and here we can see it's, it has some sort of a default values that it's working with. And let me just hit preview to see what it's going to do. And it's doing this, right? So this is definitely not what we want it to do. That's for sure. We want it to uh, create a surface through all of these curves, right? So here we need to choose automatic trim to be turned off and then hit preview again. 
Once it's off, you can see that um, Patch Tool does its best to fit a surface through all of these curves. Um, let me change the surface UV spans to something lower so that you understand how it works better. Let me do 5 by 5 preview. You can see that the resolution changed and also it starts messing up a little bit from, from here to here and also it doesn't perfectly uh, catch all of the all of the curves so there is an offset between between the curves so we don't want that to happen right meaning that here we need uh, a decent resolution so this is what I was talking about when I said during calculation patch uses resolution so let's do something high like 15 by 15 don't do too much by the way it's it's going to become really heavy 15 by 15 though seems to be okay Maybe even more, 20 by 20. Preview. Yeah, that seems fine. So once this is done, I just hit OK. And we have our landscape, right? Well, we have a start of our landscape. It's, it's not, uh, not that clean yet. So let's make it clean. Let's clean it up. So first things first, um, I will enable elevation text layer and then I'll ele enable the trees layer here. And I'll minimize the side drawing layer and disable preview of it. Just so that it's not in the way. Then I will take my surface or either I will create a new layer and I'll call it uh, landscape um, geometry. Landscape geometry. I'll make this layer something, uh, some sort of a color, or rather, let's keep it black. That's fine. Black layer is fine. And I will take this layer, which is currently located in default layers. By the way, if you don't know where, in which layer the object is located, if you select it and you go to properties, you will see it under, under the object's properties. So it's located in the default layer, right? So I come back to layers and I want to move it to landscape geometry layer, right? So I will right click on it. I'll choose change object layer. That's it. That's all you need to do, right? So now it's, it, it lives in this layer here. Okay. Now, this, is, uh, this surface is too big compared to the side drawing, right? Uh, so the side drawing ends around this rectangle, right? While this surface kind of continues on forward, which means that on the edges, we don't really have uh, any information, right? About the, 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 the site, so it's kind of guessing. And it's guessing in a weird way in some places. So I want to cut away the unnecessary bits. The way I do it is if I go to the top view in this case, top view and I find which of these lines is my border so I can see it here right so that's my border line so I select it and I type in trim t-r-i-m trim if I type it in then it's going to ask me to select object to trim um, if I click inside now of, of my border on one of the edges of the landscape like that it's going to trim out. Well, let me show you in the perspective view. It's going to trim out uh, the inside of the landscape. So we don't want that. Instead, I did Control Z to undo. Instead, I will click on the outside of the border, right, to trim out um, the unnecessary bits of the landscape geometry. So that is done. Okay. I'll just hit escape until it stops asking me questions. Um, so now we have a single surface that is fitted to the border of the landscape. That's great. And it has the correct elevation, right? So we have our site. <clears throat> Next up, I will hide the landscape drawing, the site drawing, sorry. I'll hide that. 
And I want to make this uh, form into a three-dimensional piece, right? Into some sort of a solid shape, because right now it doesn't have any thickness, right? It's an infinitely thin piece of geometry, right? A single surface. So I want to make it into a volume. Uh, the way I will do that is by selecting the, uh, the landscape itself and typing in dupe border. So what the dupe border will do is it's going to find naked edges, meaning the outer edges around the surface, and it's going to create a polyline from them. Or rather, in this case, yeah, it's going to be like a hybrid polyline. Dupe border, enter, and you can see here it created this border around my surface, right? Actually, the border is really useful when you need to find holes in uh, in poly surfaces, right? And surfaces that should be closed but are not for some reason, and then you have no idea where the hole is. You do a duplicate border, and it's going to create a, a curve around it, right? So that 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 becomes uh, quite a useful tool to finding small holes. Um, in this case, we are just getting this rect rect rectilinear, sorry rectilinear border and I want to make it um, I want to flatten it out right and then loft between the top curve and the bottom curve right so this one is curved right this border is curved of course because it follows the landscape but the base of my form should be uh, flat right so I need to flatten this out move it down and then loft it I promise it will make sense, right? So let's do it. Um, to flatten stuff out, I already showed you during the previous uh, example, but the command for that is called project to C plane. Project to C plane. It will ask me, would I like to delete input objects? Would I like to delete this guy right here? And no, in this case, I don't. Right, so I choose no, and that's it, right? I have my border here, and it got projected onto the landscape here. Oh, not landscape, sorry, on, onto the world sea plane here. Okay, so I have two curves, right? Technically, I could take this curve, take this curve, and just lock them already. But if I do that, notice how it kind of messes up here here that's because uh, delete that's because the bottom curve intersects with the top curve so all I need to do is just take the bottom curve and move it down ever so slightly so that there is no intersection quite easy so now let me again select the top curve oh by the way um, when I click on the border Notice how it asks me which one of the geometries I want to select. That's because there are two geometries in the same place, right? The border and the surface. So it gives me the selection menu from which I choose. Would I like to select the curve or would I like to select the surface? So I select the curve and holding down the shift key, I select the curve from the bottom, at the bottom, and then I type in loft and hit enter. Loft will uh, ask me to give it a seam. So basically, uh, the way Loft works, it creates a section, this kind of a line, and it moves that line in between the two curves all throughout, all throughout, all throughout this, this whole uh, perimeter, and it ends here, right? And thus it creates this kind of a, by my moving it and creating a surface through movement, it creates a ribbon. So let me hit enter. And now I go into loft options menu. I hit uh, OK because I like how it looks. And that's it. So we have our surface and our loft. So now let me, we, I don't need the curves anymore. So I still have them selected, right? So let me just hit delete button to get rid of them completely. All right. We have uh, our top, 
we have our site, we need a bottom surface, right? So to do it, first of all, I will join the top and the side because right now these are two separate, I can move it. These are two separate geometries, right? So I need to join them up. I will select both of them, the top and the bottom, or just drag around it. So I select both of them and type in join, enter. And they will join now into one shape. And that shape still has an opening, right, in the bottom. So it's not a solid shape. It's still uh, a, a collection of surfaces that are uh, that don't have any thickness. So how do we close it off? Well, the bottom part is completely flat, right? And uh, I already told you how to close stuff that is completely flat. That is uh, with completely flat opening, sorry. Uh, that tool is called cap. So I select the geometry and I type in cap. Come on, select, cap, enter. And select. And now you can see the surface was created in the bottom. Great. Now we have our landscape. Moving on to creating trees, or actually, let's move. Uh, let's make sure that our landscape is located in landscape geometry layer. So I'll just select it, and I'll right-click on landscape geometry layer and choose change object layer, like that. So now it is here, definitely. Okay, so let me hide it for just a second, and instead let me go to side drawing. And let me create the trees, right? Um, so I will do it very, very diagrammatically because I only need to see the, uh, like the size of the, how do I explain this? I, I only need to see how big the trees are uh, so that I can later on choose which ones will be kept, which ones will need to be cut off, right? So I won't do it too, uh, too extensively, uh, like the 3D modeling of them. Uh, in the side drawing layer, here, I will expand it and I'll hide actually everything. Tick, tick. Uh, no, except trees. I'll hide everything except the trees layer, right? Then I will take these um, where I see the axis, and I will create, on one of them, I will create a cylinder. And uh, for that, I probably need to create a new layer and call it trees. Yeah, let's do that. Let's create a new layer and call it uh, three, tree geometry. Tree geometry. <clears throat> Cascade the where you have the solid creation tool right here. Uh, if you click that small arrow, by the way, if I say cascade, that, that means clicking that small arrow, right? So cascade that, and then you have your solid creation tools, and you just choose cylinder. You can also just type in cylinder. That's the same thing, right? And now I will make sure that tree geometry is my active layer, so I will click here. And I'll start drawing the trees uh, or, or modeling the trees. So base of cylinder, it's asking me for a base, uh, basically for a center point of the base. So I'll click here on the X in the intersection of the X or the midpoint or wh whichever snap works for you like that. And I will expand it to be, uh, that's one meter wide uh, a tree trunk that is one meter wide is pretty big. Well, that's fine. Oh, whatever. Let's do one meter wide tree. Uh, let's just instead type in. Let's type in 0 0.3, right? Meaning 30 centimeter radius, meaning 60 centimeter uh, width of the tree trunk. Like that. Then, uh, so we typed in 0 0.3. We click or we hit enter, it doesn't matter. 
and then we need to specify the height. <clears throat> so let's specify the height as uh, two meters. Two. Enter. So we have our first cylinder, right? We, which is the tree trunk. We need a second cylinder, which is going to be the canopy. The can is it the canopy? I don't know the name of it, but where the leaves are, the, the, the canopy of the trees. So I will create a cylinder again. Cylinder. Or, hmm. No, sorry, 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 sorry. First, we need to move this, uh, this cylinder or copy the cylinder from uh, one location to every other location here, right? So let's do that first. I will take it, I will type in copy, enter. So now uh, copy tool is running and it's asking me a point to copy from, right? So I, I want to copy from the center point here, but unfortunately the cylinder is in the way, right? Of, of me finding the center point. So what I'm going to do is while still copy tool is running, I can right click on the perspective view and I can go to wireframe view. Right? So now I can see uh, be behind it, let's see, or inside of it, right? So I can copy from the actual like center point here, and I can copy to every other center point here in the, in the file. So I'm just clicking, right? Uh, move tool is the same thing as copy tool. Uh, only that it, of course, deletes the original, right? So, but it works in the same way. Uh, from one point to the other, you move. That's it. <clears throat> we have all of our tree trunks done. So now I will go back to... No, uh, let's stay in wireframe view. I need a second cylinder. That is going to be the canopy, right? So I'll type in cylinder, enter. Base of cylinder, I will give it the same center point. And this time I will not type anything in, I will just snap to the, to the circle here that shows the, the, the border of the canopy, like that. And I will ex extend it by, um, I don't know, how tall are trees? Let's say extra four meters, uh, maybe more. Let's, let's go for six, uh, so six meters. End of cylinder, uh, I'll just type in six, hit enter, a cylinder that is six meters high was created, right? We will later on move those cylinders, you know, above ground. And I'll kind of do the same thing for every other uh, tree. So maybe this one is a little bit smaller, so that's five meters. This one is going to be six again. This is going to be uh, five again, maybe. Uh, maybe this one is uh, super small, so that's only four. That's also that also seems small. That's four. Uh, five. Four. Six, six, five, and this one can be four. <clears throat> Did I miss anything? Yes, I missed one. Uh, small one, that's just four. Okay, so we have all of these cylinders here, right? The, the, the canopy cylinders. Um, they are right now, if I look at it in the shaded view, they are right on the ground. <laughs> we don't want them. We want them to be at a height of two meters because that's how high our, um, that is how high our uh, trees, uh, tree trunks were, right? Two meter high. So we need to move all of these up by uh, two meters. So you could kind of holding down the shift key, you could go like this, right? Selecting them, or you can just go to the front view, for instance, 
and just select everything above the tree trunks, right? Whichever you want. Just select all of them, click on the arrow sticking upwards, type in two. That's it. You have your, your trees. Now I want to make them a little bit nicer. So I will use... Uh, we used chamfer edge. Maybe we should use fillet edge, <clears throat> just to show you the difference. Fillet edge, enter. It asks me for a radius, right? So I will click on next radius and I will say, okay, in meters, um, let's say 0 0.5. 0 0.5. Um, and that's it, right? So then I just need to click on the edges that I want to fillet. So I'll just go for this, this group here for now, top and bottom. And they get filleted, right? And let me kind of repeat the same command and do it for here. So it remembers 0 0.5 meters. It remembers uh, when you repeat the command. And I'll just fillet all of these edges to make them a little bit nicer. There we go. This one actually I want to be a bit bigger. There we go. Something like that. Everything else seems to be aesthetically pleasing. Um, so we have that. The problem now that we have is that the canopy and the tree trunk are two different entities and you don't want to have too many geometries here. So what I'm going to do is I'll use Boolean union to join them up, right? Because this is a solid piece and this is a solid piece, meaning I can use Boolean union. So let me select, uh, I'm holding down the shift key, select the other one, select both of them and use Boolean union on, on both of them. And now they are joined up. And I'll repeat the same procedure for all other ones. So the command is boolean union. Like that, like that. So I'm joining them up into one entity. Again, I know that this is, you know, highly diagrammatic, but this is how we want it to be. We don't really care about uh, having it realistic at this stage of the project. Uh, so we just do it. Uh, we just do it diagrammatically. We showcase them diagrammatically. Uh, one last thing that I might want to do is um, I showed you fillet, so fillet rounds off, fillet edge rounds off the corners. Um, here I will just uh, remind you how chamfer edge works. So I'll just use chamfer edge. Next chamfer distance I'll choose uh, again 0 0.5, same, uh, same as here. And I'll just select this circle right here, uh, this edge right here where the trunk meets the canopy. Hit enter, hit enter again and it does that, right? So chamfer is straight edge, fillet is rounded edge uh, uh, corner. And I'll kind of repeat it. Can I do, yeah, I, of course I can do, I can select more than one edge. That, 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 eh. Am I missing anything? No, I'm not. Okay. Enter, enter. Wow. Okay, so that's that. Uh, let's uh, enough with the trees. Okay. Let us turn on our landscape geometry and then see. Oh shit! <laughs> you know the trees are in bad positions. That's fine. Uh, we can move them into correct heights, right? So I will do it one by one. Just take the tree, move it up. Make sure that it's uh, in the landscape, like that. Perfect. And just kind of repeat the same procedure for all other, all other trees. And just make sure that it intersects with the landscape uh, nicely. Like that. Like that. And this one is actually pretty close. Like 
that. Oh. Where are you? Oh, that's uh, that's my mistake. There we go. Later on, um, during your education, you will learn how to automate this project, uh, this process quite a bit with uh, Grasshopper. But now I think it's it's necessary to get the muscle memory down, uh, just to increase your speed and productivity. So we are doing it manually. Also, you know, uh, we we need to teach you the basics before we show you advanced stuff. Okay, we have all of the trees in the correct heights. Right, laying on the landscape. Last thing that we want to do with them is solve this intersection between the tree and the landscape. So we want either a hole in the landscape to fit the tree, or we want the tree to be cut with the landscape, right? Because right now there is a an intersection between the two geometries that is not clean, right? You can see that a part of the of every trunk is in the landscape. We don't want that, right? So let's fix that. <clears throat> the way we fix it is by using Boolean difference. Boolean difference, not Boolean union, Boolean difference. And choosing surfaces or poly surfaces to subtract from. So what are we going to cut away? We are going to cut away parts of the trunks that are below the landscape, right? So we're going to choose uh, the trees. The trees are going to be the ones that are going to be cut away. Right? Press enter uh, to continue. Yes, enter. Select surfaces or poly surfaces to subtract with. And delete input is set to no. That is important. If we now select uh, this poly surface here, right? Because this is the poly surface with which we are cutting away and the lead input is said to be true, that means after the cut, the landscape will be deleted, right? Will be gone because we are not using it anymore. So we still want to keep the landscape though. So we will choose delete input to be no, make sure that it's set to no, and then we hit enter. And that's it. Now we have our edges here. Why are you not, are you correct? Uh, hello? Wireframe. You are cut at an edge. Yeah, that's that's fine. That's just a rounding error. That's fine. Um, so we get our edges here in the along the trees, and they will become quite important when we will do stuff like uh, drawing extraction, right? So, for instance, here I can just kind of quickly show you. I will not explain what I'm doing here, but uh, just to quickly give you an idea of what's uh, What's to come is basically, now I have something like this. And it's still making mistakes, <laughs> come on. It's still making mistakes in some places, um, but that's, that's expected, right? So then you just kind of uh, clean it up. Um, there's, there has been quite a few, what? Uh, we'll, we'll look at it later. There has been quite a few uh, challenges with... Um... Oh, this is because it's perspective. Okay, let me just delete that. Um, extracting clean drawings from uh, a 3D model, even if it's a clean 3D model, is uh, virtually impossible. Like every program um, has problems doing that. But uh, cleaning up uh, an extracted drawing is most of the time much faster than drawing it from the get-go, you know, in 2D. That's, that's for sure, right? So, for instance, programs like Revit or Archicad, 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 um, the, 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 they do a better job at extracting, extra, uh, extracting drawings uh, from 3D models, but they, uh, that comes in with a penalty of uh, 
uh, lack of flexibility within the program itself of what can you do with the program. Here in Rhino, you can do anything you want completely, like it's up to you, uh, but it, it doesn't then doesn't do that great of a job in extracting the lines. If the model, the 3D model is clean, it's going to do an okay job, I think. If the model is not clean, meaning if I left the those tree trunks inside of the landscape, it's going to do a poor job at cleaning them up. Hope that makes sense. All right, um, let's do one more thing, and then we will finish up uh, off for today. So all of you had the task to draw um, draw your idea, draw your, your concept of a, of, of, of a pavilion, right? So you have your, your sketches, your drawings, and so on. And all of those sketches will require, <clears throat> I assume most of the sketches will require a flat piece of land. Well, at, at least, you know, somewhere on the, on the pavilion, there needs to be, you know, a little bit of flat ground, right? While here, everything is scribbled in here as is expected in nature, right? So we want to flatten out some piece. Um, you can do it by adding a platform, or you can do it by subtracting from the landscape, digging out, right? So the way you flatten things is either you dig out, so you remove, ground or you add ground so let me show you an example <clears throat> by the way are my let me delete that are my trees in this in the correct layer yes they are okay that's good so let me show you an example <clears throat> if i in the top view <clears throat> i will create a new layer and call it helper and I will name that layer, uh, not name, but make that layer like blue, blue color. Make it my active layer. And here I will decide what kind of size I want the, the pavilion to be. You know, what's the scale of the pavilion. And I will say, let's do a long one, right? So I will do F8 to, uh, to snap to certain degrees. And I'm just basically drawing a polyline, right? So I'm, I'm deciding now on the size. Let's do, and by the way, you can do any size you want. Please don't just blindly follow my tutorial. <laughs> Rather do your own stuff, right? This is just uh, to show the thought process, right? And, and then the, the procedure on how to achieve an architectural project with Rhino. Uh, you don't need to do the same project as I do. Um, so let's say I do uh, 30 meters in length and then uh, five, no, five is not a lot. Let's do eight. Yeah, let's do eight meters, eight meters in width. And then 30 meters again to the top and then close off the polyline, right? So I have this guy here, my, my polyline. I will position it in the top view. I will position it in a way I want to, it to be positioned in the landscape, right? Um, so let's say, oh, snapping is on. So right now I can turn off auto snapping. So I will just kind of wiggle it around and see. Maybe we can go to perspective view as well. Uh, move it up. This is, uh, it doesn't matter how high it is right now. We, we are just looking for, for the position. I think, I think this could be a pretty cool. Yeah, let's do it this way, right? So, my, my positioning of this, uh, of this pavilion is going to be like that, and this is going to be the flat portion of it, right? The, 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 where the ground needs to be 
somewhat flat. So what I'm going to do is uh, from this rectangle, I'll make a surface planner SRF planner surface, just like that. And then I don't need the, the rectangle anymore. So I'll hit delete to get rid of it. So now I only have the surface. And I will extrude it to make it volumetric, to make it into a volume. Extrude SRF. Enter. So it becomes volumetric. Um, and I really don't care how high it is, so I'll just, just to get the point across, I'll extrude it like that. <laughs> just a big boy there, right? Because all I need this to do is I need it to go into the landscape and flatten out at least a portion of it, right? At least a little bit of it, right? So I'll do something like, maybe something like that. So notice how my, my shape intersects with the landscape. That's, that's what I want, right? So now I will use Boolean difference, enter. And I will select surfaces or poly surfaces to subtract from. So I will carve out the landscape. I select the landscape, enter. And select poly surfaces or surfaces to subtract with. I will select my box. And hit enter again. Delete input was turned to uh, turned off uh, as, as a no. Uh, so I keep my box. That's fine. Let me just take it and move it up like that. So you can see that the landscape got carved out here and it got flattened out here. Okay. Um, the problem is that this part right here and this part right here on the left and the right side are still curvilinear, right? Because I didn't uh, cut all the way through and that was on purpose. What I will have is I will have a cantilevering uh, geometry. Right, cantilevering geometry that will um, hover, not hover, but and it's not going to be cantilevering, but I will fill this part and this part with geometry to have a solid piece. So the way I do it is I will take this uh, box here and I will move it down. And actually, I will scale it down as well to something a little bit more manage manageable. So notice that that uh, rectangle, that small rectangle. Remember that? So I just scale it down on one axis, something like that. And then I will, um, the way I will do it is I will, hmm, how do we do it? Let me move it up again. Oh, yeah. So I want the top surface of this box to be perfectly aligned with this surface right here, to be in the same height. So I need to move the top of this, uh, so, uh, this box so that its top is uh, at the same height as the surface. To do that, I will select the box, I will type in M, short for move, hit enter, right? M, enter. It will ask me to point to move from, but more importantly, it asks me, should the movement be only vertical, right? And I'll say, yes, it should be only vertical. So I'll click on it. Vertical turns to yes. And now I will choose a point. So I can choose either this point, this point, this point, or this point, any point uh, on, the, uh, on the corners of the surface. So let's go for this guy. And now you can see, the box can only move up or down, meaning that if I snap to, let me turn on wireframe view so that it's easier to see. If I snap to, let's say this point or this point, any, any point on this edge of the surface, the box and click, uh, the box will be moved to the correct position, right? Oh yeah, and notice how the, this jittery effect. This jittery effect happens if you have two surfaces on top of each other, perfectly touching. Uh, it's just a thing that it does, right? So we have that, we have the bottom of the box there, 
uh, we will need to fix that. But first, before we do it, I will take this box and I will actually now move it up, but by an amount that I know is going to be the thickness of my floor, right? So in this case, the thickness of my floor is going to be, let's go for 0 0.6 meters. So I click on the arrow here and move it up. Or rather, no, let, let's be more pedagogical. Sorry, 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 stop. <laughs> let's be more pedagogical. And actually, let's keep this as it is. And then we will create an, another uh, plate, which is going to be our floor, right? So let's, let's stick to being pedagogical. Now, I want... Um, this thing to not stick out from the bottom of my landscape, right? I want this to stay, this plate to stay in the correct position while this thing do not stick out. How do I do that? There are two ways. First one is using control points and moving the, all of the bottom control points up, right? To do that, you just select the box, you type in solid PT on, so it's not points on for, vo uh, for volumetric geometry, for polysurfaces. It's rather solid PT on, solid points on. You hit, that, uh, hit enter on that. And then you have the possibility to select these two corner points here. And holding down shift key, these two corner points here. And just move them up. Easy, right? Or I just hit escape until it... Uh, it stops giving me the control points or you can select the box <clears throat> and you can type in scale 1d scale in one direction or in one dimension hit enter it asks you for base point okay so i'll just say this is my base point and it asks you for either scale factor or first reference point so i will give it first reference point which is going to be this Point here in the bottom of the box right this guy here so I have a straight line from top to bottom and now if I move my mouse you can see that I have control uh, that the top stays as it is but the bottom moves down so I'll just move down the bottom until I'm sure that it intersects with, uh, with everything in the landscape but it's not sticking out from the landscape right so something like that I think will will be fine yes that's good. Okay, so we have that. Let us merge this box and this landscape. Again, anything that is not joined up properly and anything that is not, um, that's intersecting in this kind of way will not, will definitely screw up your uh, drawings, right? So make sure that uh, everything is clean, as clean as possible, meaning that your first pavilions, first models should be simple so that you can make them clean rather than complex and, you know, it's, it's you know, nonsense of a geometry. Okay, uh, let's merge this. I select the box, I select the landscape and I type in Boolean Union. Hit enter. Bada bing, bada boom. I have my box and my landscape merged into one entity, right? And now on top of it, I will create another box in a very controlled way, which is going to be uh, the floor plate for my, uh, for my project. So I will create a box. And here, if I just tried, you know, kind of creating a box like so, it would do something like this. I don't, I can't do it like that. So instead, I check the options on how I can create a, a, a box here. So I can go for diagonal box, I can go for three point box, vertical center. So you basically you just need to test them out and then you will see you know, what, how they work. Uh, we don't have the time to go through every single option of every single geometry creation here. So in here, in this case, what we want is we want three point box. Three point. And the way it works is that's the first point, that's the second point, and that's the third point. 
and then I can give it a height, uh, like any number. Uh, so the number of a height, I, I believe I said 0 0.6, right? So 0 0.6, enter. That's it, we have our floor plate. Right? So we have the floor plate done. We have, uh, if I want to, by the way, I can, uh, for instance, scale it beyond the boundaries of, of this rectangle by doing scale 1D, finding, uh, for instance, a center point here in the top edge, finding uh, the end of that edge and scaling it up in, uh, you know, in a controlled fashion. So uh, here it's, uh, it should be 15 meters. Yes, it is, because the whole length is 30. So I can add one more meter, right? So I will do 16 meters. Just type in 16, click. And now my floor plate extends by one meter. Yeah. And it's still located in the helper uh, layer. I will just create a new layer and I'll call it uh, floor plate. Give it a color red, for instance, and just take that box and uh, right click on the floor plate layer and change object layer. Done. Okay, so this is uh, going to be the end of first part of this uh, of this tutorial. In the second part, we will take a look at uh, different methods for creating the, uh, the, the, the geometry of the building. It's not going to be anything uh, new. So most of the stuff that I've already showed, uh, we will be using that stuff to those tools to create the building itself. I'm just going to show you how to do it in a co uh, controlled and clean way. And then we will move on to extracting drawings from the created geometry, uh, properly uh, annotating them, uh, properly showing them, and uh, I will explain how to make sections through your geometry and so on. Uh, so those things are going to be in the second part of, of the tutorial. Okay, now go and do some nice pavilions. See ya!